You are live. Okay. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Planning Commission meeting of July 7th, 2020. Um, Jen Chavez, we'll turn it over to you now. Hi there. Welcome. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. Prior to roll call, the city attorney would like to make an announcement to the Planning Commission regarding the teleconferencing of this meeting. With that, I will turn it over to City Attorney Martin License. Thank you. Uh, as you know, the governor issued executive order N25-20 to facilitate social distancing and to prevent the spread of the COVID-19 virus. This and other orders relax Brown Act requirements and allow public meetings such as this one to be held by teleconference. And the procedures adopted for this meeting meet or exceed the standards set forth in the governor's orders. Uh, and now I would ask you to please conduct roll call. And afterward, I would ask the chair to recognize me afterward to confirm certain matters for the record. Okay, item two is roll call. I'll begin with Commissioner Frank, who is absent tonight. Commissioner Kuznick? Here. Commissioner Marks? Here. Vice Chair Wallace? I'm here. And Chair Alpert? Here. All right. Okay, thank you, Jen. Martin, you now may back to you. Thank you. I would now like to verify that uh, number one, all members of the commission can hear me well. And number two, that all members of the commission have been able to hear all previous speakers, including the roll call. And number three, that each commissioner believes that everyone here that is representing themselves to be a commissioner is in fact a commissioner. Uh, if you could just indicate by raising your hand, um, one, two, seeing for every, all commissioners raising their hands, I will now turn it back over to the chair uh, with just the reminder that any votes taken during this meeting must be taken by roll call. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Martin. Thank you. At, this, at this time, I'd like to ask our recording secretary to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so moving on to item four, we have public comments or written communication. If you wish to speak under public comment or regarding a specific agenda item, you may click the raise your hand button on your computer or star nine on your telephone to request to speak when public comment is being taken. You will then be unmuted when it is your turn to make your comment for up to three minutes. After the allotted time, you will be remuted. At this time, those who wish to address the planning commission on any item not already included in tonight's agenda will be able to do so. Before I open public comment to the audience, um, I'm going to go ahead and first acknowledge that we, re we did receive a written late communication item from Jim Blickenstaff requesting an extension on the CityWalk Master Plan Draft EIR. This comment was provided to the Planning Commission in advance of tonight's meeting. And that is our last written communication for item four. So we will go ahead and move on to the audience. And again, if there's anyone who would like to speak um, on an item not on tonight's agenda, you can now press the raise your hand button on your computer or star nine on your telephone if you would like to speak during this section. And let's see, it looks like we have a couple here. I'm gonna start at the top. And I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you, um, Lenovo. If you wouldn't mind, once I unmute you, go ahead and just state your name for the record. Okay, you're unmuted. Hi, can you hear us? Lenovo? Okay, I'm not sure if they're, yeah. Mike, it looks like they're unmuted, so they should be able to talk right. if they'd like to. Okay. Um, maybe we could. We can, we can go back and, and check You want again. to move on and we can always yeah. give them another chance. Okay. Okay. okay, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute Jim Blickenstaff. 
All right, Jim. Um, Hello, can you hear me? Hi, how are you? We sure can. Wow, okay. <laughs> uh, just to elaborate very quickly on the, <clears throat> the summary of the city clerk, um, I forwarded to you a, a comment letter to the city council a week ago, um, or two weeks ago, just to uh, keep the door open on extending the comment period for the city walk master plan. Um, I understand that's still something that can be considered if uh, the city decides to do so. It's something the planning commission can consider um, that doesn't require a separate and distinct hearing on the subject. And um, I think that's in the connotation of perhaps it being administrative. So I think you can revisit that opportunity, if you want to call it that, for a extension of the uh, EIR comment period, since that plan is so important and so impacting, and we're in constricted crisis times right now, I think that would be very prudent. It would demonstrate outreach to the public, which is always a good idea for the city. And um, I think that can still be considered, even though it's a few days past the official end date. Um, so I just bring that out for your consideration uh, to see if there's still that opportunity for the city to uh, uh, allow for further public comment on a very important topic. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Okay, um, it looks like I have another speaker, Devinder Shoker. I'll go ahead and allow you to talk. And you are, you should be unmuted now. Give it just a second here. Hello. Hi there. Yes. Hi. 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 Yes. Hi. Uh, this is Dr. Shoker. Actually, I am an owner and a dentist. I own a building on 2810 Crow Canyon Road. It's very close to the city hall. And that building is actually built in 1970. Somehow in 2008, the city in the papers say that there is no building exists. They are changed their zoning to park zone. We have five, six dentists working there. There is two building exists there, but somehow the city changed the zone to park zone. I've been attending the meetings and I was assured by the city when I went there that, oh, in the upcoming event that we have and we are promoting more businesses, we are promoting more commercial and we are changing the zone of the whole area they, that will be taken care of, but uh, somehow it looks like that zone, which is basically wrongly done in, in uh, 2008 by showing that there is no existing of any building there and change to park zone. So I don't know how I can actually spend the money on a building by making it look more beautiful or commercially make it more viable. There is a actually a, big lot behind the building of my building and the parking lot. And then there is actually a big lot, which I wanted to also develop. But if my building breaks down and park is converted, I don't think I wanted to spend money and acquire that lot and actually have more commercial building in that area. So I, I think the city, city should look at that and help it rather than make me scared that, oh, this building which I bought and spent millions is gonna be converted into a park if something happens. That was my concern about that and I attended the meeting. I think this is my second or the third meeting for the city which I attended. 2810 Crow Canyon Road. If you go there in that area, there is, I think it's all dentists in that building. There's five, six dentists. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, um, Chair Alpert, I don't see any other hands raised. Okay, okay. If there's no other um, public comment at this time, we'll go ahead and close the public comment at now. Okay, moving on to item five, additions and revisions. And at this time, staff would actually like to recommend that the agenda be reordered to hear item number 10.1 city center hotel prior to item 9.1 Crow Canyon specific plan update. 
And I can go ahead and conduct a roll call vote to okay. approve or deny the reordering of the agenda. Okay. I think we actually need to take a, we need to make a motion on reordering the agenda first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So may I ask for a motion to um, flip the Crow Canyon specific plan and the hotel um, items 9.1 and 10.1? So moved. Okay. Been moved by Commissioner Marks. May I have a second? I will Sorry. second that. Oh, the tie, but <laughs> there's a tie. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll let you pick who wins. Who had second? So. <laughs> That's fine. Okay. Um, let me go ahead. I'll start with our mover. We have Commissioner Marks. Yes. Seconder Kuznick. Yes. And we have Commissioner Frank, who is absent. Vice Chair Wallace. Aye. And Chair Alpert. Uh, yes. All right. All right. Thank you. The motion passes. Um, so we'll go ahead and move on to item six, which is consent calendar. We have no items. Item seven is approval of minutes. Item 7.1 minutes from the June 16th, 2020 regular planning commission meeting. Okay. okay. Any Additions, changes, corrections from the minutes from the June 16, 2020 meeting. Seeing nobody raising their eyebrows, may I have a motion to accept as written? <clears throat> move to approve the uh, minutes from our meeting of June 16, 2020. Okay. Moved by Vice Chair Wallace, may I have a second? I will second the motion. Okay, Commissioner Kuznick second. Okay, thank you. Okay, so mover is Vice Chair Wallace. Aye. Seconder, Commissioner Kuznick. Aye. Commissioner Frank is absent and we have Commissioner Marks. Aye. And Chair Alpert. Aye. All right, thank you. Item 7.1 passes. Item eight is continued items after closing of public hearing. We have none. And we will now go ahead and move on to item 10, public hearing, new items as reordered. Item 10.1, public hearing, city center hotel. Staff report is presented by Ryan Driscoll, associate planner. Good evening. Hi, Ryan. I need to just uh, share my screen here, hold on. Okay, uh, good evening, Chair Albert. Just one moment. All right, good evening, Chair Albert and Planning Commissioners. This is an item for the City Center Hotel Project, which is located on a 1.46 acre parcel at the southeast corner of Camino Ramon and Bishop Drive. The general plan designation for the property is mixed use city center and the zoning district for the property is city center mixed use or CCMU. As you can see on the aerial photo here, uh, the subject property is directly east of the existing city center development phase one. And it's also directly south of the Bishop Ranch 3 South Parking Garage at 2641 Camino Ramon. A little bit of background. In December 2007, the City Council approved the City Center project, uh, which included a use permit for a 169 room hotel as part of that approval. And since then, that project has been invested through development agreements. In uh, November 2014, there you go. The zoning administrator approved uh, revisions, site plan revisions and development profile revisions to the city center project. In March, 2018, the zoning administrator approved a minor subdivision to subdivide the 10.6 acre Bishop Ranch 3 site into three parcels. Uh, one of those three parcels is the subject property uh, for this application, the 1.46 acre property or parcel. On March 5th, 2020, the applicant submitted the proposed applications. On May uh, 14th, 2020, the Architecture Review Board reviewed and recommended approval, uh, final architectural review approval 
and provided comments on the project to the applicant, staff, and planning commission for consideration. Uh, and on May 29th, applications were deemed complete. The applicant's proposal includes a new five-story building for a lodging hotel land use. Uh, it includes a restaurant, bar, outdoor pool, and outdoor event space. The building will be 115,496 square feet, uh, which is actually tw about 24,400 square feet smaller than the previously approved hotel with the city center project. The proposed hotel would be 169 keys or guest rooms, uh, which is unchanged from the previously approved hotel for city center, the city center project. And this proposed hotel has a 60 foot roof height which is 31 feet lower than the previously approved hotel with the city center project. Uh, the project includes pickup and drop off activities provided on the subject property. Uh, it will be uh, provided off of Bishop Drive. And there's a use permit application for a shared collective parking concept uh, with the Bishop Ranch South uh, parking garage and, and parking lots uh, just to the north. This is the existing site plan for the property. As you can see, it's directly east there, city center, and on that southwest corner of Bishop Drive and Camino Ramon, and just south of the Bishop Ranch three parking garage. This is the proposed site plan for the project. Uh, it includes the hotel building there in the middle in, in a U shape. Uh, in the middle of the U there, you have a uh, turf and a pool area. That's for the outdoor event space and hotel activities. And then around the perimeter of the hotel and property have landscaping, paved paths, and, and pedestrian plazas. Uh, you have the uh, vehicle and pedestrian access off of Bishop Drive. And then the parking would be provided to the north at Bishop Ranch 3 parking garage. This is the proposed first floor for the building. Uh, in addition to the hotel operation, the hotel includes a number of other accessory uses shown in pink here. Uh, for a restaurant bar and meeting rooms on the first floor here. Uh, floors two through five will be all be guest rooms. This is the proposed southeast view uh, at the Camino Ramon and Bishop Drive intersection. It's a rendering here. Um, you can see the modern architectural design uh, that includes large windows uh, in a variety of textured um, materials on the facade. I'd like to mention too, this is a revised uh, plan that's been um, revised in response to the Architecture Review Board comments, particularly on the west elevation, that's the right side of this view, uh, to respond to the comments for uh, additional height, uh, additional um, building articulation, and to be a little more consistent with the north elevation, which is on the left-hand side of this view. This is the proposed southwest view at Bishop Drive. This would be the main entrance for vehicles and pedestrians for the hotel. And here's another rendering uh, from the northeast view along Camino Ramon. Uh, from here, you can see the U-shaped design of the building. And there's the uh, proposed um, blade sign along the Camino Ramon a west elevation, which has been redesigned uh, based on the architecture review board comments to provide a more integrated blade sign with the building. Um, the blade sign now comes up and over the roof parapet. This is the proposed landscape plan for the site uh, with landscaping throughout. There's a, a pedestrian plaza at the northwest corner. This is a closer view of that uh, where there's a public art to be located at the top of the steps. Uh, the Architecture Review Board has supported uh, the location of public art here. Uh, the applicant has not provided the specific plans for the art feature yet, uh, but staff has concluded conditions uh, for the review of the public art feature through the public places review process. In terms of zoning standards and general plan policies, the project complies with the development standards and general plan policies for the subject property, including uh, setbacks, height, floor area, area ratio, landscape, lighting, and other items mentioned in this staff report. I'd like to mention briefly here too, a little more about height. Uh, the zoning ordinance does include a height overlay zone uh, and when it, it is applied to specific properties in the city uh, and it allows an increased height uh, 
uh, above the primary zone height limit. Uh, however, the height overlay zone is not applied in, and does not apply to this subject property, uh, primarily because uh, zoning ordinance table 2-7 establishes a height limit, a no height limit for the CCMU zone um, with uh, exceptions for uh, daylight plane requirements and height limit exceptions, which the project does comply with. Um, and then lastly, I'd just like to reiterate from before, um, the project is 31 feet shorter than what was previously approved um, for the hotel project as part of the 2007 city center project. The project includes a shared collective parking concept. Uh, the proposed hotel use requires 312 parking spaces based on the zoning ordinance parking requirements. Uh, the project includes a use permit application to allow shared collective parking and a parking reduction uh, with the Bishop Ranch uh, 3 South Parking Garage and, and Parking Area just to the north, located at 2641 Camino Ramon. Um, and the applicant has provided a parking analysis that uh, supports the findings for the use permit and has determined several, several things. Uh, first is that there's an existing 1,496 spaces uh, on this parcel uh, for parking spaces. Second, the proposed city center hotel operation would result in a peak parking demand of 158 spaces which is less than the 312 parking spaces required by the zoning ordinance. And that's primarily because of the interconnected aspects of the hotel operation and its uses. Uh, and third, uh, the parking analysis estimates a 64% occupancy during peak parking demand for the existing Bishop Ranch three offices in the proposed hotel, uh, which would result in a 534 space, parking space surplus on, on the property. So the city traffic engineer has reviewed and supports the methodology and conclusions in the parking analysis. Uh, and staff has included a condition of approval requiring a parking agreement be recorded on, on both properties uh, prior to occupancy of the pro project. In terms of environmental review, the project has been evaluated for consistency with the certified 2007 San Ramon City Center Final Subsequent Environmental Impact Report, uh, Final SER for short. Um, staff has prepared uh, as exhibit B to the draft resolution for review tonight, uh, a findings of consistency document uh, that determines the proposed city center project, city center hotel project is smaller in scale and does not result in substantial changes than what was previously analyzed in the final SEIR. -E -E Additionally, um, revisions or additional analysis are not required to the 2007 final SEIR. The uh, um, established mitigation measures um, adequately address the identified issues um, and have been included as conditions of approval uh, to the proposed um, uh, city center hotel project. And finally, no new information or change cir circumstances have occurred relative to the analysis in the 2007 final SEIR that would cause new significant environmental impacts. So staff would recommend that the Planning Commission conduct the public hearing, uh, discuss and deliberate, and adopt the resolution number 09-20, approving the proposed project applications with the draft conditions of approval. Um, and we do have the applicant here applicant team um, that would like to give a, a brief uh, overview of the project also. Um, um, but after that, I'm available for any questions too. Um, so I'll turn it back over to the chair and um, the applicant can provide their presentation uh, when you're ready. Great, thank, thank you, Ryan. Okay, before we uh, turn it over to the public for any of their questions, if the applicant would like to say a few words next. Oh, there's, there they are. Uh, that's one. I think uh, Jerry was going to go first if he's on. He, I see him there. Hi, Jerry. I'm on. Can you hear me? We can. We can. Great. All right. Great. Uh, thank you. Good evening, Chair Alpert and members of the commission. My name is Jerry Ingen, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Development and Construction for Sunset Development. 
Thanks for the opportunity to address you this evening to provide comments on the proposed hotel. This hotel, as you know, has been envisioned since 2007 as part of the original city center approvals. And while the city center plan has evolved, this hotel has continued to be a desired use for Bishop Ranch in the city. We are really pleased with the results of a, that went into a great deal of thought and planning and design for this hotel. We work really closely with the applicant on the planning and design and believe this proposal before you represents a terrific design that is well integrated into the proposed city walk master plan and Bishop Ranch as a whole. The intersection here that this sits on is really a gateway into the proposed city walk master plan and this hotel plays an important role as an anchor. It's a great, it has creates great synergy and activation with the city green that's proposed on the northwest corner of this intersection. Uh, the city city center and field work sitting on the southwest corner and connection to the Iron Horse Trail to the east. So we believe that this project provides another important element in completing the vision for city San Ramon's urban core. And we're excited to be here and excited to be, be part of this presentation. Uh, we've read the staff report. We don't take we take no exceptions. And Alexander Marin Jr. and I are here to answer any questions that might be appropriate for us. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Jerry. I guess I'm next. Can, can okay. you hear me? We can. We can. Okay. This is Roger Brown. I'm Senior Vice President and Director of Design for LK Architecture. Uh, thank you for taking time tonight for us to be able to visit with you briefly. The City Center Hotel Project has been designed to complement the uh, clean modern design which showcased within the Bishop Ranch development. Uh, our building is a little bit unique in that we've had additionally added additional floor height to the ground level in order to provide larger areas of floor to ceiling glass to allow this building to actually connect with the pedestrians in a more friendly way. So it can be a very transparent design with a very strong pedestrian connection. The hotels can provide a very warm and welcoming entrance as because the, the way the, the lobby is designed, it ties directly to the uh, exterior entry to the building, connecting the restaurant, the bar, and the lobby, allowing the visitors, when they come into the building, to see completely through the building into the back courtyard space. So it's going to be a very warm, uh, uh, welcoming entry area. Again, we have high soaring ceilings, very contemporary interior design a very open floor plan. So it's gonna be a very welcoming experience for the guests. The exterior facades are designed in a similar way with very contemporary materials and varied parapet heights, which are grouped together in vertical applications to enhance the height and the design character of the building. We try to pay special attention to the corner facing Camino Ramon and Bishop Drive. It will feature the hotel's largest room types with floor to ceiling glass and, and projected balconies in those areas. This is really gonna establish the character of the hotel and its connection to this important corner uh, and to Bishop Ranch itself. The hardscape at this intersection will complement the existing corner of the city center retail development to the west. And the increased site elevation, our primary corner will feature this uh, corner steps which are extended out to the public, including this sculptural art piece to welcome pedestrians onto our property. Uh, the current renderings, as you saw earlier, just to pick a placeholder for the art, our hope is to engage a local artist to be able to create a unique piece of art for this project. So we've worked closely with planning staff to address the ARB comments, and we believe that we have a design here which meets both their aspirations as well as those of Bishop Ranch. And I'm open to any questions when it's appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ryder. Okay. Hi, I'm Kevin Teague. I'll be very, very brief here. I'm the uh, applicant and owner representative for, for the hotel. First, I want to say what a privilege it's been to work with, with Jerry and his team and be part of part of the project now and, and to be able to deliver this project. Um, next, your staff has just been absolutely uh, professional and wonderful to work with on this project. So we want to thank you for having uh, such great staff on board. I think... Um, Almost everything technical was has been said about it. We think um, you know it's a privilege to be part of this project. That if it, you date back to the original planning, it's been in the works for 25 years. This has been approved for 13 years, and in these times, it's uh, great to be able to to move this project forward. Um, we all know that hotels are are great uh, great municipal revenue generators, but this one is really a great four star facility. It's going to be tailored for San Ramon. 
Um, it's going to focus on that midweek business traveler, while also uh, providing a great focus for the weekend East Bay traveler. Um, so we think we're going to great great addition to um, as Roger mentioned and and as staff mentioned, we had a very long uh, hearing with our review board, and we responded to their comments, and we think we have a subject now. And we, we hope that you guys will be as proud of the project as we are. And like Roger and, and Jerry, we stand ready to answer any questions you may have. So th thank you for hearing us tonight. We're excited to move ahead. Thank, thank you. Thank you. OK. OK. So I think at this time, Jennifer, I see at least one hand that's been raised. So um, I know we've also had a couple of written comments submitted. So and those have all been presented to the planning staff. but. In the planning commission, but why don't we go ahead and um, you know go ahead and take public comment before we open up to questions from the commission, if we could. Okay, no problem. So I'm just going to start by um, acknowledging we did receive a couple of written link communications. One from Ken Kupal asking about the plan for bicycle traffic in the vicinity of the city center hotel as well as another written communication item from Jim Blick and staff commenting on height limits. And as you said, Chair Alpert, these comments have all been provided to the commission prior to tonight's meeting. But um, at this time, if there's anyone else who would like to speak on item 10.1 city center hotel, you can press star nine on your telephone or the raise your hand button on your computer screen if you would like to speak. And I'll go ahead, um, we have, the same speaker from before, Lenovo, um, if you if you would like to speak, I'll go ahead and allow you to talk. If it was a mistake, feel free to let us know. Let's see here. I'm just going to see if I can unmute you. Okay. Hi, can you hear us? Lenovo. Okay, so it, I don't know, it might be a mistake that they raised their hand. So I'll go ahead, I'll remute them um, and I'll lower your hand. If you do wish to speak, just go ahead and raise your hand later. And we could just move on. Let me just um, take them off here. And we have Jim Blick and staff. Uh, I have allowed you to talk and you can go ahead and start. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. You sure can. Oh, great. Um, Ryan answered a number of my questions that I, I submitted a little earlier, but the one I'd still maybe like a little more elaboration on from city planners is a situation where you have a standard summary for a project and then under height, you, have, you say no standard. Um, that's, that's a little troubling to me in the context of our history with height limits in terms of feet and stories, et cetera. I'm not offended by the building. It's a very attractive building. The setbacks are nice. I'm just a little worried about the concept of saying there's no standard for heights. That sounds inconsistent with our history. And in fact, there was a settlement agreement a while back that had a height limit, I believe if memory serves me, of 83 feet. So in the context of our history, maybe Ryan could explain a little more how we arrived at a situation where there's no standard, because implied in no standard is that you add unlimited opportunities to raise the heights to whatever you want. And of course, that would be contradictory to what we've been trying to accomplish in the city. So if you could elaborate on that a little bit, I'd appreciate it. OK. OK. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we have Aparna. I'm going to go ahead and you should be able to speak now. Can you hear me? Yes. We can. We can. Hi, Aparna. Um, good evening. Um, Aparna Madhuredi, Chair of the Open Space Advisory Committee. Uh, hotels, um, I see hotels in our city as an opportunity to increase our retails um, and may have it succeed. So I like that idea. What I really liked was the attention paid to the street front activation that is essential, in fact, crucial uh, to the success of this place. Uh, one thing that I would um, 
recommend you look at a little bit more, actually a couple of things as I was listening to um, Ryan as well. Um, I know the placement of this hotel in a yet to develop urban core, um, it makes it harder to understand. Uh, it's somewhat of a tower configuration with the height. Um, so minimizing the visual impact of the building so it's not the functional elements are not competing with the surrounding areas or dominating the space. I feel it should enhance the space. Uh, it's trendy, definitely, uh, but the design, it should stay relevant for decades. So the, uh, what I heard was the pedestrian corner in the Northwest corner. Um, I think it doesn't address the street activation as I was uh, envisioning it. So maybe looking at that one again, the West and North elevations, not so much, I like that. Um, I would like to see um, this, the, this building and its environment have an impact on the consumers that they want to come back for more. So um, it, it, our future, uh, the city's urban core, it's, its future, um, it, it depends on how this building is placed and functions. So I would like to see it stay robust for decades a place where families can gather with friends from out of town locally, and just reviving this area on social grounds, uh, which will automatically translate into retail sales, increase retail sales um, for our city as well. So given that the hotel tourism industry has taken a hit during the pandemic, we want to make sure that should another pandemic hit or something else happens, this place is a place that will still be visited regardless. So I appreciate the attention to the street frontage, but I do want to see more, more there. That's my thing. Thank you. Thank you, Aparna. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we might have one more speaker. So Mike, you are free to speak. Thank you, it's Mike Conklin, uh, 242 I Talavera Drive, four doors down from Jim Blickenstaff's house. He's my neighbor. Uh, we walk out each morning and, and uh, look at the same sun, sunrise and the same sunset. We do see things differently. Um, but um, uh, I do appreciate uh, the fact that Jim has been very involved in, in community planning. Um, I, I just really want to look at this as a, a new dynamic approach uh, with the input of a lot of people on, you know, the green urban core development uh, that is necessary for um, the future. Um, and, and so I'm going to focus on one, one thing that Jim said, and, and some people focus on, and that's this, uh, this height limit issue. Uh, the Chevron uh, project, um, the tower, of course, is, is about the same height or maybe higher than what this is proposed. Um, and, and there in decades have been no complaints about the height of that building. There's, there's, it's just a fact that if we're going to achieve, um, you know, workplace close to uh, workplace housing, uh, you know, there's going to be heights. We're going to have to extend heights. And we're not talking about 40 or 50 story buildings here. We're talking about, you know, four or five stories. Um, I think that the project is very well designed. Um, obviously, you know, Bishop Ranch has been around a while. They know what's going on, Sunset Development. And I've seen the, the, um, their efforts and, and, and how that has um, really uh, enhanced the quality of life in our city. And I will remind you that I was here probably way before all of you others when we used to look at San Ramon as South Danville. There was nothing here orchards. We didn't have a hospital. We didn't have a library. We didn't have schools. We didn't have houses. Look what this city has done. And at the core of it, there was two individuals, Nathan Chappelle and uh, Masood Moran that had the vision. And uh, I'll add another one, 
we had a great city planning staff uh, that made all this happen. I mean, who who would have that opportunity to develop a brand new city and 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 main, it, build the streets and everything has worked? So I, I really um, appreciate the design, uh, the effort, and I, I completely endorse the project. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mike. So, Jen, before I um, close public comment, and since he did raise his hand twice and didn't speak, um, Lenovo, if you're out there and you really did intend to speak in what prior and wrote, raise your hand. If you want to raise your hand before I close public comment and try one more time, let me uh, give you just a just a second to raise your hand and try and speak one more time. Otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and close public comment. You know? Okay. Okay. And I don't see any other hands raised. So I'm going to go ahead and close public comment at this time. And, um, and then um, before I turn it to the commissioners, um, did the applicant or Ryan, did you have any um, comments you'd like to make at this time before I turn it over to the commissioners to ask our questions or make our comments? Yeah, I, I just wanted to respond to the 85 foot height comment. Um, zoning ordinance section D3-6B does discuss uh, a maximum height limit outside the city center project area. And it, it describes the maximum height as the greater of either five stories or 85 feet in height outside the city center area. Uh, this project is within the city center area so that um, limit doesn't apply to this subject site. Okay, okay. Let me then turn to um, let me turn to the commissioners then if there are questions for applicant or staff clarifications. We'll start with questions, clarifications, questions, and then we can turn to comments. Commissioner Wallace, looks like you might have. Yeah, <laughs> I have two, uh, two short questions and um, I think I know who can answer them for the applicant. Um, if I'm wrong as to who can answer the question, they can lateral it off. Uh, first question is for Mr. Brown, um, and that is during the ARB discussion, uh, it came up about one of the materials that you wanted to use on the outside of the building. Um, I believe it's pronounced RESTA, R-E-Y-S-T-A. Um, and they suggested that you look for other materials. And I was curious, and this afternoon, I did poke around a bit on the internet, and there were a number of, of people who complained about the same thing ARB talked about, which was warping, uh, staining, discoloration, and the like. Um, my question to you, and that's why I'm addressing it to you, is is the uh, parts of the building that use that material are sort of, they're not load-bearing, are they? They're, they're more for architectural uh, significance rather than actual construction? Right. These materials uh, are finished materials only. They're not contributing to the structure uh, of the building. And we've used this same, it's actually Resista. And we've used this product before on several other projects and had very little problems with it. But we're looking at the ARB staff and staff comments about switching that to another similar looking material that would have different properties as they had commented on. Okay. Um, I just, I, obviously, I read your comment that you had considered it and used it other places. I was just kind of curious about right. that, just to make sure that if for some reason you needed to replace it, you wouldn't have to tear the building down to do it. So. No, it's, just, it's a skin finish only. Okay. My next question, I believe, uh, is probably to Mr. Engen. And the question is this. Uh, in the City Walk city center development, the hotel goes up before either of the three buildings that are scheduled for BR3A. Um, it appears from one of the drawings that was uh, produced as part of the presentation that where the pool is, there is intended to be, I'm guessing about a five foot wall that segregates the pool area of the hotel from the rest of the property. My question is A, is that correct? And B, 
what are your intentions with respect to the portion of the property that goes from basically the pool area at the hotel to Bollinger prior to development of that site for the residential building? What are you gonna do? Are you gonna leave it just dirt or do you have any uh, plans to make it, shall we say, slightly more attractive? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. So eventually as part of the master plan, there'll be a park that buffers between the hotel and the residential use in that section. Um, so the, that area adjacent will be used as a lay down yard during construction of the hotel. And once that's done, it will be brought back to, to a natural state, which will probably have uh, uh, some sort of vegetation sprayed on there that will grow naturally in that area until we be, get ready to bring begin construction on phase 3A. Okay, all right, thank you. Commissioner Marks. Uh, um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to just follow up on Eric's last question. Um, I had that same question, I think, and I'm talking about what is referred to as parcel O on the landscape plan. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, Jerry, is that, is your comment applicable to parcel O? Uh, maybe Ryan, you can share your screen and show where that where they're talking about. I, I don't have the parcel numbers memorized. It's plan sheet L100. It's, it's immediately between the pool area and the future driveway. Just a minute. here can you see this oh there it is this is parcel O here right mm -hmm. can, can you go to the landscape plan or that's just down below that shows the the pool area yes just a moment So I, I, I think that that one plan, even though it's black and white, will work. Yeah, this is the photometric plan, sorry. But it does well, show. So, there you go. There's the pool here and the wall. Right. And then the property. I'm, I'm talking about the property that is directly below where the tree line is. Um, it's between the pool area and mm -hmm. um, what I believe is a future driveway. And on There's plan sheet L100, it's delineated as parcel O. Right. There shouldn't, there's, there's, there's uh, that vacant. Right there. Yeah. So that area between where that new proposed roadway is and the hotel, that is going to be the future neighborhood park that's in part of BR3A that's on the currently proposed master plan. Okay, my, my, my follow-up question is, what is the timing of that? Um, and the reason I ask that is it, it just seems that with a hotel of the caliber that you're proposing, um, which is very well done, to have a 260 foot by 80 foot dirt strip in front of it just seems I don't know, it doesn't seem to fit. And I just wondered, would it be a problem 
for just that limited portion of uh, the uh, North Parkway Green to be planted at the time of occupancy of the hotel. Um, well, our plan was to do a hydro seed when the work was done and to have natural vegetation there so it wouldn't be a plain dirt site. But it wasn't going to be improved with lawn and trees as if as if it was a fully built park. Okay, let me, let me Jerry, if I can, can I ask you please uh, two more questions? Um, on the on plan sheets A one hundred three and A one hundred four, those are the plan sheets that show the hotel rooms, the actual rooms, and the rooms have three different designations: CK, DK and SK. I'm just unfamiliar with what the abbreviations are, what the acronym is. That's probably more, import, uh, more appropriate for Roger to answer. Okay. Okay, I, if you can hear me, uh, the CK is a classic king, the DK is a double king, and the SK is a studio king. There are just three different room designations that we have in the hotel. Okay, I, I just... Um, I came up with my own list of what they were. <laughs> it's not that complicated. <laughs> my last question. Um, I, I have in the last couple of days sent some uh, questions to Lauren um, about sustainability. Um, one, of the, one of the questions I have is, while you talk about sustainability in the uh, master plan and in the development package. Um, and Lauren has indicated that um, you've been talking about lead certification at the silver level. Um, I'm wondering if that is still the, the intent um, when you construct the hotel. That's what I've been told by the applicant is that they will go for lead silver certification. Okay. Um, because for me, that, that's an important distinction. I had toyed with the idea of adding a condition of approval to require that, but I don't think I will do that. Um, what I will do is, is rely on that, um, that comment that um, significant um, green building will occur for the hotel. That, that concludes my questions. I have some follow-up comments later on, but um, I, I appreciate getting the feedback. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Kuznick, any questions for you? Um, you know, first of all, um, I do. I have one. Um, and I, I, I'm going to fall into something of a stereotypical moment here. Um, I, like, I like the hotel. I like the plans. Um, I'm looking at the first floor um, layout. And I know um, in, in various places where we have been introduced to this project um, as part of either as a standalone or with other parts of the um, city walk project. You know, someone had mentioned at one point about, um, is there gonna be a spa at the hotel? And, um, you know, I can't quite see it. Doesn't mean it's not there. But again, you know, with this idea of upscale, a destination spot, um, um, I would put my two cents worth in saying that, um, if there's still time to add one, that might be something that, um, why you gentlemen may not appreciate it, I bet your wives would, or your daughters or other women in your life. Um, we'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll back out of my uh, um, confining comment here, but uh, anyways, it is a beautiful, as, we, as I've seen it in the renderings, uh, it seems like a really beautiful location and, um, Think that that would be a nice element. I, I had a question. I just was just for clarification: Is the stub of Bishop Drive that is in front of the hotel, is that a city street or currently, or will it be a city street when the hotel is built, or will that become private property? I couldn't tell if, from looking at the plan, or I didn't. I don't remember what I read when I was going through the plans, Ryan or okay. Jerry. I'll address that. Sure. So it's currently owned by the city. 
but I have been working with the engineering department to vacate that city or vacate that right away to make it private, which is what will allow us to make some improvements to that street and the connectivity for Iron Horse Trail to improve the current connectivity for Iron Horse Trail to the east over to city center. Okay. And create a little more landscape buffer and make it a make it much more part of the neighborhood instead of kind of just a look like a driveway. Right. Okay. Good. Okay. And and then will uh, and then will that become part of the city walk master program or is that's will that be part of the hotel program in your... well ultimately it will be integrated integrated as part of the city walk master plan. Okay. So the hotel okay. is going to be responsible for all the improvements that's within the property line proper of the hotel and Bishop Ranch and the master plan will be responsible for the further enhancements of that of that area to the north and to the east. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. That answers my my question on on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I think that was all of the questions I had on the plan itself. Any other so questions? I, I, oh, I have yeah. one more. Yeah. Um, and thank you for the last picture on the driveway. Was there ever a discussion of putting a pedestrian bridge across the roadway to the parking garage rather than um, people needing to to cross the that little stub of, of Bishop Drive to get to the um, the garage? The, there was never a, a, a discussion around a bridge as that that would be fairly expensive and, and uh, difficult to do, but there is the connection, the safest connection that we found with the city traffic engineering mm -hmm. department and us is the signalized intersection. We don't want to promote people crossing mid block that's not protected. So right. we want that to happen there. Further on the east side of the project, as the master plan develops, there will also be connections to be able to be made on the east side coming out of that garage. So there'll be two points of access okay. to the hotel. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the commissioners before we flip to comments or? Further discussion. Seeing none. Okay. Comments on the project at this time. Everybody's quickly reaching no. for their mute button. Yeah. No. Okay, Commissioner Rick, Marks. Rick Commissioner yeah. Marks. Um, I'm going to be very brief. I I really like the design. I think this is um, attractive. I think that as um, one of our um, other speak, not our speaker, but another speaker said, I think it will stand the test of time. Um, it's a very easily supportable project and, and I'm in favor of approving of it. I also want to thank the applicant for full size plans. Um, <laughs> I, I like working with large plans. And these were great. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's funny. Okay. Commissioner Kuznick or Commissioner Wallace. I, I'd like to say um, that that I think that the plan is very well thought out. Um, I especially uh, am fond of, of the degree at which it is pedestrian friendly. Um, that uh, it, that that corner will be a lovely, attractive corner. Um, you know, I look forward to to seeing what kind of art might go up there. Some sculpture. I have some thoughts on that, but that's for a different type of meeting. Um, and and I would like to also say that I really like the idea of um, this shared parking concept um, as we are trying to move away from our uh, just love affair with the automobile um, to, to say that, you know, we have a parking garage, let's get the most use out of it instead of having to build another parking garage. And so um, I really like that idea and applaud you guys for um, making the most of it. And, and again, as, as we've seen a number of the elements of this much larger plan, I think that's one of those things that uh, development, you know, minds seem to really be focusing on. And so I applaud that. And, um, I think that that's a really good use instead of having to pave someplace else in addition to what's already paved. So that, that's great. I, I really appreciate that. Um, Mr. Wallace. Um, I like the design of the hotel. It's uh, it's got a little pizzazz to it, 
And uh, as some of you may know, I was not a real fan about putting the hotel at the back of the property as opposed to being on Bollinger where everyone could see it. Um, and there's still part of me that believes that, but clearly to use the uh, unutilized parking structure just uh, north of where the hotel is going on, it really requires that the hotel be in that uh, particular area. Um, I think across the street from field work will do wonders for somebody. Um, <laughs> not exactly sure who. Uh, the only other comment I made is that I have is um, some of you live around here, you know that it gets 100 degrees in the summertime. And I was just kind of curious why you're so in love with fireplaces. You have a fireplace in the hotel, you have fire pits outside. This struck me as a little bit counterintuitive to have all that heat generating material. But I guess if you want to have a barbecue out by the pool, it makes sense. But uh, I wish you luck on the hotel. And I hope that you use every single one of those keys. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'll uh, I'll also be brief. I also like the like the project, and I also want to compliment both Ryan and the staff, as well as the applicant, for putting together a clear, very understandable, you know, point by point, you know, response to the architect's um, suggestions and recommendations, and taking those serious, and also the shared parking study. I thought that was extremely readable, easy to follow, and so. Um, I think at this point, you know, if we could have a, um, a motion on the resolution so that we can um, continue deliberating and review the, uh, the resolution at this time. Is there someone? Well, I would move, move that we uh, go forward with uh, reviewing and approving the resolution and the uh, associated conditions of approval. I will, uh, does this need to be seconded? Yes. Because I yeah. am in favor of seconding it. Okay. Okay, so we've had a motion right. to accept resolution number 09-20 and seconded. So if we can pass it page 425, if we have any yeah. Thank you. Qu That's okay. questions, comments, any, any, anything? We don't need to go page by page, but you know. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Um, there are a couple of things within the reso that I think um, we should take a look at. Packet page 428. In the second whereas, there is a typo. Currently it reads, whereas none of the conditions described in, none of the conditions described in. Mm -hmm. um, I think okay. we want to take that out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good catch. Got it. Mm -hmm. That's it. Do you have another one, um, Commissioner Marks? No, I'm. I, oh, okay. That was it. Okay. Anything else on the resolution? Okay. Turning to the conditions of approval, starting on page 438. So, Chair, is this requiring a, a separate motion or is this part of the. No, okay. I think I'm getting the a, shake. I'm getting the shake off here. <laughs> Thank I'm, you. I'm looking at, I'm also looking at the at <laughs> Debbie and Lauren and, and Martin, but they're not. <laughs> I think the one resolution, one motion was fine. Okay. The motion is second, so the commission can uh, vote at any time. Yeah. So the main sure there's no uh, no comments or corrections or additions to the conditions of approval. I I do have something. I'm sorry. Yeah. No. Thank you. Packet page four four one, where it says. Transportation Division. Mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. um, number 26, it says City Center Shuttle. Um, I think it should read the operator of the City Center Shuttle shell and then the following bullets for A, B, C, and D. Good comment. 
Yeah, we can make that change. Um, gentlemen, can we go back to um, packet page 439? Um, down at the bottom, engineering services number 10. Um, could, could we just get a quick explanation of what I proposed vacation abandonment of Bishop Drive means? That was, just, the, that was just the a term I didn't know. The Jerry made regarding uh, oh, okay. taking over ownership of that piece of driveway there. Uh, okay. So as city right away, we have to abandon it okay. and, and turn it over to the private property owner. All right, thank you. That, that explains that short and sweet. I'm looking to see if there's any changes. No, I think we have no other changes. Okay, I think we're ready to um, have a roll call vote. Um, All Jennifer. right, Thank sure, you. no problem. Okay, we will start with Mover, and that was Vice Chair Wallace. Aye. And Seconder Kuznick. Aye. And then we have Commissioner Frank, who is absent, and we have Commissioner Marks. Aye. And Chair Alpert. Aye. All right. Okay. Item 10.1 passes. Okay. And resolution oh. number 0920 is approved. Okay. Just thank real, you, everybody. Real quickly. Thank, thank you so much. Go ahead. One moment. Lauren has a, a little announcement. Yeah, I just <laughs> wanted to state the uh, decision of the Planning Commission is subject to a 10 day appeal period. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So prior to going on, do you want to take a three minute break before we or a five minute break before we go on to the Crow Canyon specific plan? Looking to see if you want to take a stretch break for water? Yes. Okay. That would, I got be, a yes. That would be that would be um yes. Okay. Most agreeable. Okay, right. so five minutes and we'll come back for the next item. So come back in four minutes sharp. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Ththank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody.
Okay, are we all back? Oh, well, Martin's not back, but oh, Martin's back. Okay, we're all back. We can go ahead and come to order again and resume. Okay, Jen. Are we ready? Okay. Yes. So um, uh, we are going to move back to item nine now, continued items, open public hearing. Item 9.1 is continued public hearing draft Crow Canyon specific plan update. Staff report is provided by Cindy Yi Sin Planner. Thank you. Good evening. Um, Jen, would you mind promoting Andrew Hill? Yeah. Thank yeah, you. No um, I'm here this evening to um, provide you with a staff report on our fourth public hearing for the Crow Canyon specific plan. Um, Andrew and I will be actually tag teaming tonight on our PowerPoint presentation. So I will go ahead and share my screen and I will have Andrew start us off with the um, first part of the report. Not sure if you can see my screen. We can. Yep. Okay, great. I'll go ahead and Andrew, you can go ahead and take it away. I yeah, I unmuting myself. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, so my name is Andrew Hill. I'm with Dayton Batia. As Cindy said, this is the fourth hearing on the Crow Canyon specific plan. Um, so uh, I have a brief overview tonight. Cindy, I, I can't see the presentation. Oh, uh, did it go Try away? Again. Sorry, I That's must have okay. moved it out of the way here. There we go. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so I have a brief uh, presentation tonight. I want to give a, a quick overview of the draft plan and, and the process, but then really mm -hmm. devote the the bulk of the presentation to responding to questions uh, from the commission uh, from prior uh, hearings. Uh, so next slide, please. So our objectives tonight are uh, to respond uh, to the prior uh, requests for additional information, um, to hear further public testimony, and uh, to receive uh, feedback from the commission as well. Next slide. Uh, as uh, you all are probably well aware at this point, the Crow Canyon uh, specific plan covers a 134 acre uh, area at the northwestern portion of the city. Uh, and the draft plan that's before you tonight is a targeted update to the 2006 plan. Next slide, please. Uh, over the past 18, 20 months or so, um, we've uh, completed a number of steps. We've prepared uh, an existing conditions analysis. Uh, we conducted a variety of different uh, workshops and community outreach activities to gain input, to inform the update to the plan. Uh, we actually uh, went in and drafted um, the update to the plan and put that out on the street for public review. And additionally, the team has completed environmental review of the project. And so now we're in the, uh, the hearing phase. Next slide, please. Uh, specific plans in San Ramon uh, are required to be prepared, adopted, and amended in the same manner as the general plan. Uh, the city's measure G requires uh, that subsequent amendments to uh, the general plan be adopted by a 5-4 vote of the city council after a recommendation in favor of such an amendment is made by the 5-4 uh, vote of the of the Planning Commission uh, following a minimum of three public hearings before both uh, of those bodies. Um, and the same uh, requirement applies for specific plans. Uh, additionally, an addendum to the Crow Canyon specific plan environmental impact report has been prepared uh, in accordance with CEQA um, and uh, will be adopted as part of the adoption process. I'd note as well that we have representatives from First Carbon Solutions uh, here tonight uh, who are available to answer any questions you might have on the, on the addendum as well. Next slide, please. Um, and so the draft uh, that you have before you tonight is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, an update to the 2006 plan. Um, it retains the broad objectives of the prior plan, um, but uh, a number of refinements have been made uh, to ensure that the, the plan uh, reflects and responds to uh, changing conditions. 
Um, the refinements that we've made respond to direction from the City Council and, and the Commission received at the start of the process, uh, specifically uh, that we refine the mix of housing and commercial uses in the land use plan, um, that we uh, clearly uh, define development standards, um, that we improve connectivity, um, and make some changes to the circulation network, and enhance uh, the historic context uh, statement, make sure that that's integrated into the plan. And so with those um, marching orders, we have uh, moved ahead and, and updated the plan. Next slide, please. Um, at prior hearings, the council had made a number of requests for uh, additional information, um, six in total, which are uh, listed on the sheet before you. And uh, what I'd like to do with the rest of this presentation is uh, take them one by one and uh, provide the information requested. And so next slide, please. So the first request uh, was from the commission to add a stronger emphasis on uh, pedestrian orientation and walkability for the village center. Uh, and in response, uh, we've edited two uh, sections of the plan, uh, chapter three vision and also chapter four land use uh, to provide those details. Um, red line language of the proposed changes is in the packet uh, tonight. Um, specifically, we've added language to uh, related to walkability and the pedestrian scale, the development pattern and the and the type of uses. Um, talked about uh, pedestrian infrastructure, specifically sidewalks and paseos. Um, emphasized the high quality of design, both in building design and streetscape features, and uh, touched on the amenities, the benches, the public art, the landscaping um, along the frontages that would be um, uh, envisioned. Uh, and so uh, tonight we'd like to hear from you if uh, that's going in the right direction or if you have any further comments um, on those edits that are redlined in the packet. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the, another uh, topic was uh, had to do with the small lot uh, consolidation. Uh, draft policy LU14 in the draft plan would provide incentives in order to encourage uh, small lot consolidation. Uh, in total, in the planning area, there are about 20 parcels uh, that are 1.5 acres or smaller um, on odd shaped lots that are adjacent to larger vacant or underutilized lots. Um, ownership patterns like this that are fragmented in this way uh, limit the development potential. Um, you can, the map's a little bit hard to, uh, to see, but you can see there are some uh, of these smaller odd shaped lots in the village center area, some more in the PDR district and some others um, the, on the office condo uh, site in the, in the south of the, um, of the planning area. Uh, and so as a way of um, addressing this issue and uh, incentivizing um, redevelopment that, that can catalyze the change that's envisioned with the, um, with the vision for the area, uh, we included uh, land use, policy land use uh, one four um, and suggested some potential um, incentives that could be offered in order to um, uh, encourage that consolidation. And tonight we'll be looking uh, for direction or further input from the commission as to whether those proposed incentives are appropriate or if there might be other ones uh, to offer as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the commission also requested that we consider uh, adding a slope height formula um, to account for differences in elevation within the planning area um, and also to provide some context about the height of existing buildings, both in the plan area and adjacent to it. Um, in particular, the planning commission mentioned the PDR and the, uh, the commercial service commercial districts as areas of concern, given the steep topography, particularly in the in the west of the planning area. Um, so for a little bit of context, the 2006 plan had established a 40 foot height limit, um, but a number of projects that uh, came forward pursuant to that plan um, had uh, resulted in um, uh, heights that uh, community members and decision makers had expressed some um, concerns about. Um, and so taking on board that feedback as we worked through uh, the process of updating the plan, uh, it was determined to establish a 30 foot maximum height limit for both the PDR and the commercial service uh, commercial uh, districts. Um, and uh, what you can see in the, uh, we did some, some site studies uh, to help illustrate what this 30 foot height would look like. Uh, and you can see them in the photo simulations that are being shown on screen. Uh, on the top, that's a view from uh, the, the bridge at Fastoria Way, uh, looking west towards the hills. 
And you can see at a 30 foot height, for, we, we did two test sites, the Golden Skate site and the California Strength site. Um, and uh, those simulations are showing uh, you know, what, the, what the height would look like from that um, key vantage point on the bridge. As you can see, they would not obstruct views. The uh, second, the lower photo simulation is a, a view from Hooper Drive, and it's showing what 30 foot buildings would look like on Golden Skate and California Strength in comparison to some of the uh, existing development. And as you can see, uh, existing development um, in the area is uh, already at, uh, at 30 feet, so that would be consistent with what's in the area now. Um, across the way in, uh, in Danville, there's some residential structures that uh, that are uh, outside of the plan area, but adjacent to it, and they are about 28 feet in height. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so it is uh, possible to add, uh, to incorporate a sloped height uh, formula into the plan um, in order to, uh, to address uh, height differential. I think there's, there's uh, two options for doing that. Um, the first one would be to apply a sloped height formula within the district. Um, so, for example, uh, if we looked at the commercial service commercial district, um, that would mean, for example, potentially allowing buildings up to the 30 foot height maximum along San Ramon Valley, Valley Boulevard, which is at the lower elevation, um, but uh, uh, um, restricting height so that they uh, allowing uh, lower buildings uh, in the west where the where the terrain is is higher. Um, if we were to apply a slope type formula within the same district, for example, service uh, commercial, service commercial, uh, that would actually result in um, lower building heights than exist today uh, in the Hooper Drive area, for example. The second option would be to apply a slope type formula uh, at the site level. So that means apply it on a specific site only. And uh, there's some graphics uh, at the bottom showing how that could work. Um, for example, we could measure the height as the difference in the relative elevation between the midpoint of the roof pitch um, and the finished grade a little bit lower down the slope. Um, so if it's a flat roof, uh, that would just be the, the top of the building as shown at the left. But if it's a pitched roof, you take the midpoint as shown at the right um, and the difference between that midpoint and uh, the, the finished grade um, on the lower portion of the slope. Um, doing that uh, would would help to um, regulate the height uh, within the district, so you'd have an even um, building height uh, within the same district, even if the actual building height might be um, a, a, a little less. You'd have even over the course of the district. Uh, so those are two possibilities. Uh, we'd like to hear from the commission whether uh, whether uh, a slope height uh, formula would be something you'd be interested in adding, and if so, whether either of those options uh, would be in the right direction. So next next slide, please. Um, there was also a request uh, from the commission that we incorporate standards for uh, integrating trash areas, enclosures, and building service areas. Uh, the 2006 uh, Crow Canyon specific plan had uh, included uh, provisions uh, that uh, specify areas should be fully enclosed in buildings if possible. Um, so restoring those provisions would be one option. Um, another option would be to, uh, to uh, implement something similar to what's in the current zoning code, which has a little bit more detail. It requires screening for areas adjoining public streets, rights of way, and residential areas. Um, and it describes uh, architectural compatibility of, of screening materials. But both specify that loading docks and service areas must be screened from public view. Um, and so we were looking for tonight some direction from uh, the commission as to uh, which of those two options is, is preferable. Next slide, please. Uh, the commission at previous meetings had also requested a break, uh, uh, had also requested uh, clarification um, regarding the switch from uh, the 100 foot creek setback that's in the 2006 plan to a performance standard, standard for the protection of the riparian corridor adjacent to the uh, San Ramon Creek and, and its unnamed tributary. Um, the commission had requested uh, clarification as to whether the new standard is uh, consistent with the general plan. Staff had initially clarified that uh, the Crow Canyon specific plan area was uh, was not subject to ordinance 197 which established the uh, 100 foot creek setback back in 1990 
um, but that nonetheless that 100 foot uh, setback was applied uh, in the 2006 plan. Uh, upon further consultation and research uh, with the city attorney's office, uh, staff is now recommending that the 100 foot setback um, be restored to the plan in order to maintain consistency with the, with the general plan. Um, and the packet uh, that you have in front of you tonight shows a red line revisions to the policies uh, that are proposed to, uh, to restore that 100 foot creek setback standard. Um, and so tonight we'd be looking uh, for uh, feedback from you all if that's going in the right direction or if you have any further comments um, on those uh, uh, recommended edits. Next slide, please. Uh, a uh, fifth thing that the commission uh, requested had to do with um, a, break, a breakdown of the cost estimates for public improvements. Uh, and this would include the demolition and streetscape improvements such as sidewalks, curb and gutter improvements, lighting, uh, streetscapes uh, that would be required to implement the plan. Um, the estimates that uh, that are in the plan originally came were religion, originally prepared for the 2006 plan, uh, but they were refined and updated uh, with input from uh, the public works staff um, for uh, for this draft. Next slide, please. Uh, there was also a request uh, for detail on how non-conforming uses are regulated uh, in the city, and so in response. Um, staff has included attachment E excerpts from the zoning ordinance that provide um, detail on that. Next slide, please. Uh, I also wanted to point out that uh, along the way, there's a number of other uh, edits and revisions that have been recommended by uh, the Planning Commission and also in response to, to public comments. And so we're capturing all of those in an errata sheet um, that will continue to update and bring back to you on August 18th. Uh, but uh, some of the key things that we've captured so far have to do with design guidelines, uh, the service life of materials, lighting standards, uh, private streets, the uses uh, that are allowed in the various districts on tables A1 through A3 in the appendix, and also about wayfinding and signage. Next slide, please. Um, additionally, a couple of the points where we'd like some, um, some feedback. Um, the, uh, we would like to get some additional comment from the Planning Commission with respect to uh, multifamily residential height limits uh, in that district. Uh, their a property owner had submitted a, a letter uh, previously. The standard that's in the draft plan on table 4-1 uh, establishes a maximum height of uh, 45 feet, um, which could potentially allow for residential buildings of up to four stories. Uh, the land use description for the multifamily residential area states that typically uh, development in this category uh, is apartments or condominiums of two to three stories tall. And so that indicates that in general, the expectation is that buildings will be about two to two to three stories tall and that not all of them will be built up to the maximum of 45 feet. Um, but uh, we'd like additional feedback uh, from, uh, from the commission as to uh, uh, if you have any further comments on the proposed height limit for the MFR district. Uh, next slide, please. There was also some um, uh, clarifications requested uh, regarding the, uh, the parks acreage, and maybe I'll turn it over to Cindy. This is where we're going to tag team a little bit, and I'll let Cindy uh, respond here. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so this slide here um, sh identifies the current proposed park acreage within the Croquet and Specific Plan. Um, on uh, June 16th, a request was made for clarification on which parcels and, and what acreage were associated with the park sites. And so at the time the packet was prepared, um, we had identified these four parcels that are currently shown on the land use map as um, park sites. So since the publication of the staff report, um, staff further researched the land use designation of these parcels. Um, all previous and current general plan land use maps since the city's incorporation actually designates five parcels as open space and park. So when we look at just the progression of um, the zoning and the land use for um, this park area, um, I've highlighted here in, in some of these circles that 
the city's um, land use designation and um, zoning designation for these parcels, um, since the city's incorporation um, has been park or open space or, or a combination of those two. And um, as it currently stands, the city's general plan identifies five parcels as park sites. Um, so in addition to those four parcels identified in your um, staff report, there's a fifth park site that currently maintains a park land use designation. Um, 2810 Crow Canyon Road um, is currently shown in the Crow Canyon specific plan as, as 1.19 acres. And um, in 2006, when the Crow Canyon specific plan was adopted, it identified two parcels, the redevelopment agency parcel, kind of on the northern side of Old Crow Canyon Road, and 2810 Crow Canyon Road as open space and park designations with a creek overlay. And these parcels match the general plan land use designation of park. But upon further research, as I mentioned, um, the current general plan identifies five parcels, um, all five listed in, in that table. And so while two of those sites in the Crocane specific plan um, are um, currently zoned commercial service slash office, the general plan designation, the underlying general plan designation remains as park. And so there's um, actually an inconsistency with the current 2006 general plan, or, and I'm sorry, the current Crow Canyon general plan and the, the city's um, general plan. Um, and so in order to maintain that consistency with the general plan, staff is going to recommend that all five parcels um, maintain that general plan um, and Crow Canyon designation of open space and park so that they remain consistent. And so in this hatched area here is that fifth parcel located at 2810 Crow Canyon Road um, that we're recommending to maintain as an open space park designation. And um, Pending comments from um, the commission this evening, we will go ahead and update the errata table for your consideration on, on August 18th. Um, our next steps after tonight's meeting um, would be to reconvene on August 18th for an additional hearing on the um, specific plan and the addendum. Um, and then um, upon a recommendation from the Planning Commission, um, bring the plan before the City Council for their hearings um, tentatively scheduled for September. So with that, that concludes my presentation. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. I know there was um, some new information that was not in your, in your staff report. And so I'd be more than happy to, to address those or go back to some of these slides if, if there's questions. Okay, thank you, Cindy. I think, before, I'm sure we will have some questions, but let me first do public comment if we have any. Um, Jen, I believe we did have some written comments submitted in advance that I'd like you to at least um, announce. And also, I think uh, we'll see if anybody would like to speak um, before we turn it over to the commission to ask their questions. So, Jen? Sure. You know? Yeah. Um, what we'll do is, um, before I take members of the audience who may like to speak, I just want to share that we did receive a late communication from Jim Blick and staff requesting a delay in the Crow Canyon specific plan update due to the pandemic, as well as he voiced concerns with CEQA, spacing, retail and office spaces, housing and traffic. Now this comment was provided to the planning commission in advance of tonight's meeting. And there were no further written late communication items. So at this time, what we can do is let anyone in the audience who would like to speak, um, they may raise their hand 
or press the star nine button on their telephone and you will have three minutes to speak. And I see Jim, Jim Blickenstaff would like to talk. So he looks like he's our only hand raised right now. And I will go ahead and allow you to talk. Hi, Jim. Hello again. Hi, um, Jim. Hi, I did send a, a short outline of some concerns. It's 11 different points and it would take a number of minutes to go through it. So I'm just gonna summarize very briefly the essence of what I was saying. Uh, but just prior to that, I wanna say, I do appreciate when the city does things in a, a manner that uh, is reflective of caring about parks and open space and view sheds. And so I give the city some kudos for being sensitive to height limits because a view shed is part of the ambience of a city and the height limit affects the quality of that view shed. So I'm, I'm glad to see staff and city are paying attention to that. And a creek corridor, the standard for that forever, in my mind has been hundred feet. And I'm glad to see the city leaning toward a hundred foot corridor for the creek again. That just makes a lot of sense considering our history. Um, the outstanding question on this particular plan remains parks because in my mind, a creek corridor is not a park, it's open space, it's valuable um, green space, but it does not, uh, is not consistent with the classic definition of a park where you have a lot of uh, grass area, you have a baseball fields, soccer fields, other amenities that make it uh, more of a classic park. Um, we need those desperately now more than ever because of the issues in society with the pandemic and the future economic realities. I think parks are gonna become more critical to the quality of life, especially allowing space for parks um, because that's gonna become an ongoing issue for a long time to come. The basic premise of my 11 points was around uh, compliance with CEQA law. Um, this in my mind is more egregious than the city walk plan in the sense that it depends on a plan that's 14 years old. And that plan um, is of course out of date and then it's magnified by the facts the realities are now that we're in a pandemic crisis with all the different dynamics and change in norms from that. So in that regard, I think this is crying out for a more standard EIR approach, which the city can still do. I think it'd be appropriate to look at doing that now rather than later and really cover all the bases of all the, the new modeling that's gonna go on for the future that are completely unrelated to a plan that's 14 years old. So um, the essence of my concerns is that we re-examine uh, satisfying sequel requirements and make sure we have the input of the citizens on this with all the new dynamics and planning that's going on right now uh, from a plan that's really out of date in my mind. So that's my quick summary of the points I brought up and I appreciate you giving me a moment to speak about them. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, Chair Albert, I don't see any other hands raised, but if you'd like to give them just a moment, okay. if anyone wants to raise their hand at the last minute, we can. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands, but okay. Okay, I'll go ahead and close public comment. And um, I think what I'd like to do tonight is we'll start with questions of the commission. And I see that um, our, our CEQA consultant, as well as is also on tonight. So we do have the opportunity to you know, ask questions of that as well. So um, Cindy or Andrew or, or Mary, if we do have questions of anything presented and in an attempt to try and, you know, we'll start with questions, but I think, you know, Cindy, I think it your I think you'd like to try and get feedback on all of the points that you raised tonight, all six, maybe seven or eight questions. So, you know, if you can try and help keep us honest to make sure that we don't leave any of the open questions where you said specifically you'd like, you know, feedback from the commission. Let's make sure that we don't leave any questions unanswered tonight. I think that would be, you know, that would, I would, that would be very helpful, you know, so don't let us off the hook tonight. Yeah. So let's start with any questions on what was presented tonight. You know, we can, I know we're going to obviously have questions on the park and the zoning and things like that, but 
you know, maybe we can leave that one sort of for last because that one's going to obviously be the most complicated, I think, to discuss. But on some of the earlier items, you know, let's start with any of those that, you know, do we have questions? Just, yes. Why don't we go ahead and get started? Commissioner Marks, you, you look like you sort of nodded yes. Mark, yeah. You saw him, you. Hmm. Commissioner Marks, go ahead and go off mute. Oh, I, we can we can do that. We can then. We did. We took care of you. <laughs> now you can go ahead. <laughs> I, I do have some questions that I'd like Andrew to answer regarding the slope type formula, um, and ask him to please put the slide back up mm -hmm. where he showed um, the two options for right. um, the districts. Right. And while he's doing that, and I think I just had sort of a change of heart about the process I think I'd like to do. Why don't we stay on the slope height formula? So, you know, you, if, you could, if you could stick with slope height formula and then we'll stop there and then let the rest of the commissioners deal with slope height formula. And then we'll move on to the next item. You know, that way, you know, we're not ping ponging around as much as sometimes we might do. That way, that might be a kind of a better way to sort of get through this tonight so we don't yeah. You know, yeah. You know. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah. I, I guess, Andrew, my question is, and, and perhaps I'm just not understanding the point of one of the graphics, the one on the right. Um, in these two districts where we're mostly concerned about slope height, we do not allow housing. And yet the form that you used is a residential housing form. Um, two and three story office buildings typically do not have a gabled roof. They are typically flat roofs. Um, and so telling us that, you know, we can go to the midpoint of the roof. I'm, I'm not sure what, what you're trying to drive at there. Why, did, why would you use a, a residential form in these two districts? Yeah, there is a, an existing building um, at the top of Hooper Drive um, that doesn't quite have a gabled roof, but it does. Uh, it does sort of mimic that form. You're you're right. Um, typically, construction um, in in both of these districts would be flat roof because that's more uh, economical. Um, uh, uh, but uh, anyway, I, the, um, the, this was just really in the interest of presenting two different. Uh, options for how how it could be applied. So if we if we went with the one on the left, what you're saying is that on a site by site basis, we would simply go 30 feet. Uh, yes, the, but the 30 foot would be the 30 foot height limit would be measured from the lower elevation as opposed to from the upper elevation. Mm -hmm. Right, as shown in the graphic. Yes. Okay, and you were looking for us to make a decision about which way, which way we want it to go? Yes, I, I think, I mean, the, the slide before sort of lays, lays out the sort of narrative of how the 2006 plan had a higher, higher uh, height limit. It's been um, reduced with the draft plan down to 30 feet, that that's consistent with the existing buildings in the area and and around the area. So as uh, understanding that context, the, you know there's there's two potential options for applying a slope tide formula, um, if if that was necessary. Um, so looking for direction of whether you all think that a slope tide formula should be applied, and uh, and if so, uh, how would it operate? Considering well, you know these two options or others. Okay. Based on your analysis, where you had indicated that, um, let me put it this way: I certainly don't want buildings that are um, in the, in either of the district to have to be um, at a competitive disadvantage or, or mm -hmm. get in the way of reasonable redevelopment. Um, I can live with thirty feet, and I would I would perhaps prefer the. Um, the graphic on the left, um, unless my colleagues come up with something that, that I haven't thought about. So my, my recommendation is this, the flat roof building um, with the height measured from the lowest portion of the building to 30 feet. Well, 
Well, let me ask a question to Rick because Rick brought up the slope formula. Uh, it was my recollection that the issue was a 30 foot building down on San Ramon Valley Boulevard is one thing, yeah. but if you stick a 30 foot building up at the top of Hooper, um, it looks much higher, a much more dense building because it starts out higher above the, uh, uh, the flatlands down on San Ramon Valley Boulevard. Um, one way to yeah. do it, I suppose, and I sort of thought that was what we were looking at is for every so many feet above San Ramon Valley Boulevard, you drop the maximum height of the building down by a certain amount. Say for just hypothetically speaking, for every 20 feet above San Ramon Valley Boulevard, the maximum height would be one foot less than what it would be in San Ramon Valley Boulevard. Right. Um, well, that, that is what I had in mind, and I'm, I've been going back and forth all day about this. I, I think that's the way to go, but um, you know, I'm waiting to hear what, what some of the other commissioners think. I, yeah. I do have a concern that um, th this isn't for me so much about blocking the view of the hills, because I don't think we're going to be, be doing that. It's exactly what you said, and it's not as viewed from the Fostoria Bridge, um, it's from the flatlands um, as you drive in front of it um, along San Ramon Valley Boulevard toward Danville or from the freeway. Um, I, I'm not sure, I guess I was kind of thumbing through some notes here while I was talking. I'm, I'm wondering why we didn't go in a direction that said for every X number of feet, you lower the building until you hit a max or a maximum amount that you're going to lower it by. Yeah. Uh, if I could jump in there, I think that is that that is something that we could do. That would be along the lines of option one. So if we take that example of uh, uh, um, the CSC district, the differential between uh, San Ramon Valley Boulevard and up at the top of Hooper is about 63 feet. Mm -hmm. So you know, lowering one foot. Uh, the maximum height for each 20 feet in height differential would result in 27 feet at the top of Hooper. But Cindy, if you go up one slide, uh, you know, to the prior slide, you can see that there are already existing buildings in between California Strength and, and Golden State that are already 30 feet. Mm -hmm. And so applying this sloped height formula within, within the district would allow only 27 feet, um, you know, right next to, right next to that building. Uh, and uh, given the fact that you know office or um, light industrial type construction would probably require a floor plate of you know of 15 feet, um, you know 12 to 15 feet, then really you're only getting two stories there. So the the effect of applying that um, slope height formula through the district like that would would be to only allow buildings that are shorter than buildings that exist here today. Mm -hmm. So it's well, a possibility, Andrew, but it is a it is a adding an additional layer of uh, of constraint um, and well, limiting the development potential. Andrew, in the in the lower picture, there's a building uh, that is to the left of the the Hooper Roadway. Mm -hmm. um, it's between the trees. Yeah, keep going. Incorrect. Yeah, that's it. Now that and I believe is right at the top of Hooper Drive. Yes, and is my recollection because I drove there today for that purpose of looking at it that building is at least two, if not three stories effectively. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's what a three-story building would look like right at the top of Hooper. And if you build on the uh, east side of Hooper or Old Omega, wherever you want to call it, that building is going to be even farther down the hill. So I, I, when I looked at your drawing here and you put California Strength as a 30-foot um, building, I don't buy that because the building to the right is about 30 feet tall. Correct. It is. Yes. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so that the, the hypotheticals you have there, uh, I, I don't think are accurate. And the building that we're looking at is sort of the template for a, a 30 foot building or so. And that seems to me to be fits in the neighborhood. Um, so, I mean, I think we can, you know, maybe play around with the formula. What is the, the height limit down on San Ramon Valley Boulevard? The also 30 feet. It's 30 still feet. 30 feet? Yes. It's a, yes, both 
every um, the same height limit applies to every property in the commercial service commercial, and that is 30 foot max. Mm -hmm. So through the chair, if I may also just add, um, in the staff report on package page 15, it, it highlights the difference in height in the current plan and the proposed plan. Um, at, at one point in time, height slope um, might have been an, an issue um, in part because the CSO district actually allowed for a height on Saramone Valley Boulevard of 40 feet. Yeah, and now the current plan establishes 30 foot height limit along Saramone Valley Boulevard and then going up through to Hooper Drive and, and Beta Court. And so certainly height um, in the, the proposed plan would be much shorter than the original plan, which had um, 40 feet in some places and then up to 50 feet with a residential overlay on some mm -hmm. of the upper um, mm -hmm. Uber Drive parcels. So on a 30 foot height limit, how many stories do you get? I think it depends on the type of, of uh, structure. It, it that's, does. That's it, what my husband would say. Yeah. If you if you assumed a 10 foot uh, floor to ceiling height, you know, for office, which is uh, which is doable, um, then it could allow for uh, three stories. Okay. Just to make sure I understood the what's got us down this path, Commissioner Marks, you you were more concerned about the. 40 foot height looking much too tall if we placed it at the top of Hooper than having it down on San Ramon Valley Boulevard. I, I thought you were less concerned about is that that was that was what the initial comments were, I believe. It wasn't so much that you were concerned about 30 feet or 40 feet on San Ramon Valley Boulevard. It was the, that same height building at the top of the hill appeared much taller and you were looking for a mechanism to have in the a well, way that, to that control was the, the height. Right? That was the example I used, but again, a 30 foot building at the corner of, um, you know, San Ramon Valley Boulevard and, and uh, Faria Preserve Parkway and 30 feet higher up still has an impact. I, I guess what I had been hoping um, was that we would have several options to take a look at for a slope height formula and see what each one yielded. Um, I, you know, I feel, I feel a little bit like I've been given one and, and I know Andrew has put a lot of work into it. Um, I'm not real happy with the results, but I, I'm feeling a little bit trapped. It's, it's either take it or leave it. And, and I don't really feel like that's the way to go. I think you should you should explore something that takes a look at as the grade increases, what's the effect of lowering a building one foot or two foot, um, and you know give it give us a few options there to see whether or not we think one is better than the other and what are the pros and cons of each. Um. <laughs> Well, I, I, I mean, I agree with Rick because I thought that when this subject originally came up, the whole idea was 30 feet down at San Ramon Valley Boulevard doesn't look the same as 30 feet up at the top of Hooper. And it just looks like a more massive building, even though it may be the same uh, size. So that's where this, that's as I understood the slope formula, the higher up you are in the hill, the lower the building has to be. Um, and so, you know, I agree with Rick that I'm not sure that the uh, what we've been given really meets that fair criteria. Now, maybe it's not possible to do that. I don't know if there are other cities that have this type of of um, formula in them to to do that. I, maybe they just use the the cleaver approach. If you're above a certain level, you can only go it up to 25 feet. Um, I don't know if they're as fine as what we what I had thought we've been talking about, but I I think I. I would agree with Rick. I would sort of like to know whether there's a, a reasonably feasible approach that sort of scales down the building as you go up the hill um, and still is feasible to develop. Maybe you can't, I don't know, but I'm looking at that building up at the top of Hooper, um, you know, and that's pretty much like three stories. That seems to me to be something that we could live with. 
So just to trying to think through this a bit. So right now the max is 30 feet even on San Ramon Villa. The San Ramon Valley Boulevard, because right. everywhere C commercial service commercial is 30 feet. Looking at the land use map, so if you start at 30 feet and you drop anything per foot in elevation, it's only going to be lower in height. Is my understanding of what we're talking about? Is that that's everyone agree that that's that's a true statement, right? If we start at 30 and you drop anything as you go up the hill, it's going to be less than 30 feet when you get to the top of the hill. And I also think I heard, at least from Commissioner Wallace, that that building at the top of Hooper Drive that we see next to the two trees is 30 feet. And at least according to Commissioner Wallace, that if that's 30 feet, that felt sort of okay at 30 feet. So, okay. Rex, so far, yeah. That that's that's how I hear it, and and I would like to just weigh in at this point and and i too have spent some time walking around there and 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 making sure i brought my civil engineer husband to help me um, understand heights um i at this point i am uh looking at the 30 feet going i i don't see that as being objectionable i think when you look at this table one the elevation differences in the districts um you know the commercial uh um, the CCS or CSC, um, where you have a difference of 63 feet from the top to the bottom. This seems like we're we're twisting ourselves into pretzels to not get a lot of bang for the buck. Um, similarly, um, it seems like we are creating a pathway in which we are encouraging people potential builders to cheat, uh, which is like, well, maybe, you know, if you're going to do like, if it's, um, uh, you know, we've gone up two feet in elevation. No, no, I think it's only, you know, like one foot. Um, and and I, I don't think that pathway is going to get us uh, into anything that is more desirable then what we see both current buildings and again, um, and I know this is in the in the report, you know, the houses in Danville, you know, over the property, the city city lines, they're 28 feet tall and they're actually higher up the hill. Um, and and they're not objectionable at all. Now, yeah, they even have the pitched roofs. Um, so I, I, I'm just, I think we've talked ourselves round and round this slope height idea. Um, and for me, I'm starting to feel like it's much ado about not what okay. we're going to get out of the bang. Okay. Hold that, hold that one, one second. So thank you, Commissioner Kuznick. So um, I want to pause for a sec. So if and I'm going to stay on the commercial service commercial and we'll talk about PDR second in a sec, but if 30 feet at the top of the hill, hill, and we haven't heard from Commissioner Marks yet on his his feeling about that, you know, if that feels right, assuming it's 30 feet on the one building that's in the picture. Um, if that feels about right, you know, then the only way we have to make it do anything different is to allow buildings on San Ramon Vill um, Valley Boulevard be taller, you know. <laughs> Because if you're going to end at 30 feet, the only way you can go down to an end at 30 feet is to start taller. <laughs> is my thinking is right? And if you're going to go drop by two feet for every so many feet in elevation, then you got to start someplace greater than 30 feet. So, you know, in my mind, the only way to start at greater than 30 feet is if you say start at 40 feet on San Ramon Valley Boulevard, and visually that starts to feel really, really tall along San Ramon Valley Boulevard to end at 30 feet. So I'm starting to talk myself into kind of where Commissioner Kuznick was, is that if we're okay ending at 30 feet at the top of the hill in the commercial service commercial part of the plan, we're not talking about PDR yet, you know, then starting at 30 and ending at 30 might just be okay, you know. And then we can still talk about how we measure 30 feet, you know, on the two pictures on the on the staff report, but that's kind of where I'm starting to come out. But I haven't heard 
fully from Commissioner Marks or Commissioner Wallace. So I want to stop and let Commissioner Marks chat now. Uh, can I ask a question to the city attorney? Uh, Martin, if I can, assuming the, the commission wanted to go with a formula that said that that, that yielded buildings uh, that were less tall than other buildings that have already been built. In other words, a newer building would be small, would shorter in height than an existing building. Does that raise any legal issues in your mind? A new building, new permit is say 28 feet and an existing building down the street is 30 feet um, do you, in the same district. Do you have a problem with that? I don't. It's a standard, just like any other standard. If you're 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 in the process now of applying a whole slew of different standards to uh, undeveloped properties, and and having them uh, construct and develop under under new standards, and height is just another one of them. Okay, and um, something I would just have commissioners think about. Um, Commissioner Kuznick pointed out the residential development in Danville on the hill. It's one thing to look at a 28 or 30 foot tall house mm -hmm. and another thing to look at a large bulky office building that's 30 feet. So it's not just height, it's the mass of that building and it's, it's the bulk of the building that you're also concerned about. Uh, and, and so for me it, it raises some concerns but um, like I said, I, I wanted to hear what other commissioners thought and, and weigh what that uh, general feeling was. Uh, to respond to uh, Commissioner Marks, one of the things is, as we have um, debated this, this, pride, this specific plan for months now, is uh, when I am out and about to, to look at other buildings and see what I think of them. So for example, out in Doherty Valley on Ivy Hill, and I think it's Japonica, there's several, there's quite a large area of, I, I believe they're condominiums. And um, it's quite, and so that we're talking about above or more or less above Doherty Valley High School. Um, quite a lot of them and they're, mostly three and four, I think they're three stories. Um, yeah, three. And, and so, I mean, that's just a comparison of it, to your point about the massing issue of it. Um, and, and so I'm just trying to say that it, my answer is based on having really spent quite a lot of time looking in our city, looking at places that are up on hills and where they're located. Um, you know, San Ramon Valley Hospital is up on the hill um, and those office buildings, uh, for example. And, and just, just so that that's kind of how I'm framing my, my answer to you in terms of both height and mass. So thank you for indulging me. Commissioner Wallace. Well, I think the, the issue is, do we want to send the consultants back to uh, look at a sort of sliding scale um, slope formula uh, where you reduce the actual height of the building as you're going up the hill? Or do we just conclude that 30 feet on the top of Hooper isn't so bad after all, and we can live with that? I mean, that's really what it boils down to, it seems to me. So, yeah. I mean, if we've already concluded that 30 feet at the top of Hooper is something we can live with, and I think Commissioner Marks made a made a comment that it's the massing, and he's talked about that repeatedly, then that starts to get addressed by the design guidelines as much as it does the height, you know, and we can look at that, but you know, to me, it's a sliding scale. The only, you know, we think we it. Again, I'll repeat what I already said. If we think we're okay ending at 30 feet, the only way to have a sliding scale and end at 30 feet is to start someplace greater than 30 feet. And I don't know that we've ever really discussed starting greater than 30 feet along San Ramon Valley Boulevard. Yeah. And I'm not sure that that makes sense to me. 
chair i just like to remind everybody that with the removal of the housing overlay you already already reduced the size of potential buildings on these mm -hmm. areas mm -hmm. um, and so i would be careful about doing a sliding scale for the sake of a sliding scale if you're going to impact the viability of redevelopment because if you want to see some of these properties redevelop they're not likely to go to a smaller uh, standard mm -hmm. a less of, of a, a height standard. And so, um, you know, I don't know that 25 feet or 27 feet is viable for a commercial project. And so just be careful with the, those types of considerations. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry, through the chair. I'm not sure in terms of the screen that I'm sharing, if you can see the side by side I put up with the two plans. We can. We can. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, and I just wanted to show you on the on the left hand side of the screen is my left hand side of the screen is um, the 2006 plan and the right side is the proposed land use diagram. Um, in this hatched red area is where that residential overlay yeah. Yeah. is currently located, which is on the high side of the, the, the sloped area. Um, the height currently allowed on the residential overlay is 50 feet. Um, whereas now in the new plan, anything in this pink area from the city limits down through beta court in this blue would be limited to 30. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I'm, I, my impression um, at this point is that a 30 foot building up either in the uh, beta court area or the commercial service is probably not going to involve such a massive building or high enough building that it's really going to look that dissimilar from what may be down farther down on San Ramon Valley Boulevard. Um, certainly willing to allow the consultant to go back and make another shot at a sliding scale. But um, I, I think we probably all can live with a 30 foot height limit at the top. A little bit harder on beta court because it's even higher up. Um, it's just that it's farther back and it probably wouldn't be quite so visible as you would say where the golden skate is. Mm -hmm. that, that seems to me to be a little ameliorating possibility. Mm -hmm. Well, for the sake of, of moving this along, I don't want to hold it up because of my particular point of view. I can live with 30 feet. Um, and um, hopefully when we get to the site specific development of something, we can mitigate whatever visual impacts we see there. Okay. Commissioner Kuznick, are you in agreement with Commissioner Marks's? Uh... Yes. Okay. Commissioner Wallace, can you live with uh, that as well? Well, I can live with almost anything, but I can. Live <laughs> okay, and I can't do. Okay, so okay. I think we can. I think we can live with the thirty feet. And then, was there a was there a question on the mechanism for measuring the option one versus option two that we needed to deal with at this point? Just to close out this item C on the staff report. Uh, the, the, we go ahead. Well, my question would be, uh, forget about the slide. What would, how would we measure it right now? The 30 feet? Yeah. Measure the midpoint of the roof right now in the zoning ordinance. So it would be, we're using the, the formula on the right. Right. Okay. And so I think what we want to do is use the formula on the left. Mm -hmm. At the lowest point of the slope. Right. I think that needs to be noted. Okay. 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 You came with six or seven things you want us to decide, and we've done one. We're doing. <laughs> we're doing pretty good. Let's 
that that's okay. I think that might have been one of the harder ones. The harder that, yeah. I think so too. Yes. Well, okay. we're going to take we're taking credit one by one. <laughs> so perhaps I'll I can move us back to item A from the staff report. This was related to adding in some additional language related to the village center. Mm -hmm. Um, and in the staff report, you have the uh, track change version of, of what's proposed to be added. Um, perhaps any comments on the on the additions to the text? The, the, you're talking about the vision statement that appears on packet uh, pages 12, 13? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll, I'll start. I don't have a problem with the language. I mean, it's pretty broad and, and general. Um, Hopefully we can make it work, but I don't have a problem with the language. And that's both chapter three and chapter four, um, um, Eric? Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, I'm gonna um, just say that uh, particularly on the, uh, the chapter three vision, I, I actually thought the rewrite was outstanding. And um, uh, so bravo. I, I would like to make a suggestion. I like what was written. I, I do. I don't have a problem with that. But it occurred to me, and I went to a, an architectural dictionary uh, to try and see what it said. It, it might be helpful if the plan itself in the VCMU area um, defines paseo and defines cutout areas. Um, okay. We're relying on those as though they are well understood. Um, terms and um, they're not. And so I, a short definition that's included somewhere in the in the uh, plan, I think would, would save some confusion downstream. I would agree with Rick and particularly because the, the term Paseo is used in a significant portion of the plan and it also is a significant aspect of the plan. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I, I agree with them. We should have a useful definition for that term and, and as well as okay. the other, as, as well as cut out. Too. Okay. I can support that. Mm -hmm. I agree. Okay. No additional comments for me. Nice job. Okay. All right. So moving on to the second item, small lot consolidation incentives. Um, land use policy 1-4 already discusses incentives. And one of the comments from an earlier meeting has um, requested additional information on what parcels this would affect. And um, ultimately it's, it's about 20 parcels that are less than a, a one and a half acres in size, mm -hmm. um, relatively odd shapes. Sometimes you'll find them in the middle of uh, another parcel. Um, but um, some incentives that are already in the policy include parking, um, increased FAR heights. Um, so I wanted to see if there was any additional feedback on some um, other incentives that we may want to add to policy 1.4. Could I get asked for a, a clarification on this one? Um, <laughs> Who, who receives the, the incentives? I mean, so you, we have these small lots. Is the presumption that you're going to have a single entity come along and buy a, a group of these and that they're the, per, they're the entity then that receives the incentives? Right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just checking. So uh, I guess my question is, in terms of feedback, are you looking for specific incentives that should be embraced within the Crow Canyon specific plan? Yes. So if you're satisfied with how policy 1-1.4 1 is already written, um, we, can, we can live with the the current incentives that are identified. Um, we were just providing the option to the commission to add any additional incentives that, that you might feel are appropriate. I could just jump in there. Uh, I would say, you know, the increased FAR 
height, streamlining are things that are already offered um, mm -hmm. to projects that provide affordable housing through the state density bonus law. And so if we're really trying to incentivize, these are already available to people. So they might not offer, they might not be much of a carrot. Um, mm -hmm. And so if we're really trying to incentivize a small lot consolidation, we might need to think a bit more widely. And that's kind of the, the impetus for asking this question. Um, it wouldn't be applicable everywhere, but for example, in the village center area where there are some smaller odd shaped lots adjacent to sort of linchpin parcels, then um, offering, for example, an incentive like streetscape improvements um, could be a way of, uh, of encouraging uh, that small lot consolidation. So that's kind of the pathway that we were uh, thinking of and, and looking for input along those lines. I think it's a very good idea. Yeah. I think so long as whatever the the uh, effort on the part of the small lot owner is considered significant by the city, um, it significantly helps uh, the project move along um, or add to the streetscape. I think that's a, it's a good idea to try and think of some more. If you read the zoning ordinance, in fact, um, I, I don't recall if this is these are mentioned as incentives in the plan yet, but for instance, small lots might wanna share loading docks and refuse areas. Mm -hmm. um, and that re eliminates mm -hmm. um, the need for each one to have, have a separate one and maybe mm -hmm. allows more parking on site. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think the more you can think of that truly add something to the public realm and also give the property owner a little bit of an advantage, I think that's worth doing. I had a just a question in general on incentives. Um, are they binding if some property owner comes along and talks to the city and said, I have an idea, can I do this? If it's not written in the policy, does that mean it can't be offered or is, you know, because this is a long term plan and who knows what could become a great idea 10 years from now that we didn't think of today just because it's not written in the plan? I mean, is there a cost for not having it written down in the plan today or is this like suggestions or, I'm just curious how these this policy in particular is treated. I think it's possible if I, I don't know, I, I can answer that I start to anyway. I think uh, it's in the way you write it. Um, mm -hmm. And so we could write the policy to be more open-ended and allow for the possibility of other things. The question then is how does that policy become implemented? You know, is there something that gets written to the zoning code that presents a menu from which, um, you know, the, the developer and the city would, you know, on which right. they would negotiate um, that, you know, that's a possibility. Yeah. I think the city would simply have to make a finding that whatever it is that is being offered that's not delineated in the policy is both significant in terms of helping the project redevelop and significant in terms of its contribution to the public realm. Right, yeah. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know what's of a benefit to a current property owner or a future property owner that might cause him to want to buy the guy next door, you know, 10 years from now. It might be something we never thought of, but you'd want to, you'd want to anticipate something could come up. And I would just want to make sure that we could do that, you know, and if the future city council and the future city manager thinks that's a good idea and it's good for the city and, you know, there's a, a deal to be made, you want to be able to ensure that it could happen, you know. I think if I could just offer a little insight on that front, I think yeah. it's actually the smaller parcel owner that you're trying to incentivize. They're probably right. the one that's less likely to want to sell. And so yeah. the way to do that is essentially to provide the larger parcel owner yeah. with some sort of bonus or right. something that helps with the financial feasibility such mm -hmm. that they could offer more money to the smaller property right. owner to encourage the, yeah. them to sell. So yeah. something along the lines of, you know, that's why we're thinking of bonus FAR or streetscape right. improvement, something that helps with the financial feasibility of the of the whole project and mm -hmm. therefore offers the larger property owner the opportunity to perhaps up his offer to the or her offer to the um, smaller property owner. Got it. Okay. But well, at I the same it. time, but at the same time offers something significant yeah. in the public realm. Yeah. Right. And, and I trust that the future city managers, city council, city staff would ensure that 
it's a good deal. <laughs> yeah, and that's just want to make sure that we don't. I, that's why I was just curious how these policies get translated into future deals that we can't think of. You know, today. Okay. With the chair. Um, yeah. On the shared screen, I've I've put up um, the current language for policy 1.4. Mm -hmm. So we could probably just amend the second part of that, um, the second sentence to instead of of being a, a list, a, a complete list, um, we can just add the phrase such as. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's okay. what I was going to suggest. Yeah, yeah, that okay. takes us off the hook about being clairvoyant. There you go. Perfect. Okay. Thank yeah. you, Cindy. Sure. Okay. So we're three down. <laughs> um, but um, th oh, 3B, we we're still on development standards. Um, we were just, there was a comment related to uh, integration of trash enclosures, um, building service areas. And so um, staff is recommending taking one of, of two options here to incorporate into the new plan. And would this apply to all of the different land uses designated in this plan? So, you know, the housing area would be the same as the PDR as far as trash enclosures or the- Yeah, in terms of integration and, and screening. Okay. Uh, well, I'll, I'll start off. I would go for option two. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would absolutely agree. The zoning ordinance is far superior in how it deals with these things. Um, I think go with the zoning ordinance approach. Okay. All right, that was easy. <laughs> All right. So moving into Creek setback policy. Um, in your staff report, there's starting on, on packet page 17, um, there's red line track changes of what's proposed to be added into the Crocanian plan. Um, and essentially how staff approached this was we took all of the policies that are currently in the 06 plan and um, incorporated them within the, the new document. Um, and then um, elaborating or, or making very specific um, the requirements on the creek setback and, and how the creek um, um, how the creek trail and and um, and um, the the maintenance and construction of those of those trails would be would be done as part of this um, as part of the policy. Well, I, I'm the one who brought up, I think, the, the setback because originally we were talking about a three to one performance standard. Mm -hmm. And as I read the general plan, uh, it applied to the creeks in the Crow Canyon specific plan area and required a hundred foot setback. And I didn't see a way to do it, to change it from, from a hundred feet to 3.1 or three to one without violating the, have an inconsistency with the general plan. Mm -hmm. um, so that was sort of my original thinking on that, um, which I still think is correct. Now, that being said, um, it's outside the scope of the Crow Canyon specific plan review, but next time we get around to looking at the general plan, I think we ought to rethink some of those drawings because um, I'm not sure that they're really valid anymore. I did have a comment since you were talking about the Creek policy. And that has to do with policy LU5-2, which is a funding mechanism. And as I read it, uh, as sort of the price that owners pay for doing new development, which I assume could be re rebuilding or improving existing property, not just to tear down and build up, they have to fund a mechanism, the purpose of which is to maintain the Creekside improvements, which is a city amenity. Now, uh, in both the Crow Canyon specific plan and to a certain extent, I think in our general plan, you know, this use of the creek is considered an amenity for the city 
as a whole to use, not just for property owners in the area. And I have a, a negative reaction to making the property owners pay for maintaining a citywide benefit. Also, on, uh, if Martin's still around, I seem to recall there was a case up in Oregon where a property owner wanted to improve their property. I think it was a hotel. And the city said, well, we'll allow you to improve your hotel, but you have to dedicate land along the creek for a creek trail for us. And the Supreme Court said that all you, although you can require a property owner to provide mitigation for the benefit that they're getting, you can't force a property owner to provide unrelated benefits to the city. And this, to me, at first glance, sort of falls into the same category. Uh, yeah, I think you're referring to this uh, a hardware store in the city of Teagard, Oregon. Yeah, it was an Oregon case. Yeah, uh, and that was a rough proportionality case. So yeah. they're, they're, in that case, they actually did find a nexus or some relationship between the impacts of the development with the, uh, with the exaction that they were looking for. It was just that they were asking for too much. Yeah. Um, in this particular case, when we're talking about uh, when, when we're talking about uh, creek maintenance and creek bank maintenance and that type of thing, there could be a disproportionate benefit to the adjoining to the adjacent property owner if, for example, the the creek work w was was creek bank preservation um, and and erosion control and that type of work. Uh, so I think you could make a case in, in, in this case that there that some added benefit goes to the adjacent property owner. Well, that sort of almost sounds like an ad hoc basis based upon the condition of the creek is the money that's being used that would actually benefit the property by keeping his or her property from falling into the creek. Well, that's that's true of just about any area-wide um, uh, exaction or area-wide uh, fee. It may or may not benefit the person who's paying the fee directly, but the but if it benefits citywide, then the courts have found that to be uh, a, a legitimate exaction. Well, would a legitimate exaction being paying for the whole maintenance of the trail or contribute there too? Well, that that would be subject to a fact-based analysis. Okay. So what you're saying is there could be an exaction for the purpose of maintaining property that has some benefit to the joining landowner. Well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm saying that there, there could be a case made for uh, for having the adjacent property owners pay a, a disproportionate amount when compared to those that are not directly adjacent to the creek. Mm -hmm. Okay. They mentioned the, the community facilities district, but you know we have that because the cost of providing services to a newly developed area often exceeds the revenue that the city receives from that area. So it's sort of make everything whole. That's the, sort of the, the idea behind that. Um, I don't know that this accomplishes the same thing. Now I'm assuming that the, the word maintenance doesn't mean build from start. In other words, this is to maintain a, a trail or a, a amenities that the city initially pays for and it's basically upkeep costs. That's right. Okay. Okay. Any other comments related to the Creek language? I did not. I didn't either. Oh, no. I have another question. Another question. Um, if you turn to packet page 19, uh, the uh, second paragraph at the top, it had is creek frontage treatment. Um, this, the penultimate sentence in that says, doors should be provided between buildings and the CRZ 
so that occupants can enjoy the amenity, period, close quote. Um, I'm just wondering whether, you know, you're, you're requiring people to change the structure of a building in order to, you know, build a door so people can walk outside instead of around the building. I mean, some of these, if you've been over in that area, some of those buildings are raised above the ground because of the slope of the building to create a door on that side. I don't know what that would do architecturally, but that, that just seems to me to be unnecessary or maybe just too much. I'm waiting to be convinced I'm wrong. I think the question there is what's the public interest? It seems like a, a buyer beware or a buyer, you know, make a decision kind of thing, but whether the doors there or not is really not a public interest particularly. Just a comment on the the that particular text. Um, that's currently in the 2006 plan, and so staff essentially just brought over that text from the old plan into the new one. Um, I don't believe there would be a consistency issue with the general plan um, because we've already addressed the 100 foot setback. The the doors or the the orientation of doors wouldn't have a a general plan consistency issue, and so you could. If you if if the commission so chose, um, eliminate that language. Well, and just to be clear too, that language applies to new development, not the existing buildings that are there. So, mm -hmm. new buildings or homes are built in that area, they would be required to front towards the creek, if possible. But not we're not amending new con existing buildings mm -hmm. to relocate the doors. Well, I think it's maybe I'm the only one who's concerned about having doorways. Um, no, I'm agreeing with you. Overkill. I, I'm agreeing with you. I don't see what the public interest is in where the doors are. Well, maybe the suggestion is that the um, the paragraph ends before that sentence. You know, to reduce and activate the open space. Sorry, if I could I mean, just do, make a suggestion, it might actually be more, uh, maybe it's not doors per se, but maybe it's openings or transparencies. It could be a window. I think the objective there is to provide sort of eyes on the creek and and have and to have a visual connection uh, with the amenity uh, to sort of to activate it um, and not have blank walls and not um, if if there was going to be a creekside trail there and there were buildings with just blank walls, it might ha um, not be a place that has a strong sense of security and safety. And so the idea, I think the intent, the original intent of that policy from the 2006 plan is to have uh, eyes on the creek, so to speak, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and promote a visual connection. So maybe um, changing doors to uh, something, doors and windows or openings or, or uh, some degree of transparency might be a better way of achieving the objective. Okay. Well, let, let, me, let, me, uh, flip it, let me flip it around. Um, if the idea is to look at the trail and people are walking down the trail, do you really want them looking into your building? Yeah, you can control that, I suppose, with blinds or or, or something like that. But then, then, then I, I, let me follow up on what Rick said. What is the public benefit in that situation? Perhaps a sense of safety. So. Oh. If you, if you take a look at the land use and urban design, page 60, we talk about development along the creek and sort of enhancing the design and embracing the creek to bring the, you know, all of the design guidelines talk about having windows along the creek and looking out along the creek and everything else. So mm -hmm. is this section slightly even redundant? That one paragraph yeah. is mm -hmm. we're are, we were okay with when it was a design guideline, but now we're, we're talking about the creek policy here. So, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, if we want the, if we want the creek to be part of the, the design guidelines, then we want the creek to be part of the design guidelines. So, you know, I, I was okay with it then, and I'm still okay with it now. Maybe we're we shouldn't have it as part of this creek section we're talking about now. Then you know, and just like Commissioner Kuzink said, just end the sentence. 
where we did, you know, because we already have design guidelines talking about take advantage That's of the true. creek. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, maybe, to, just to help everybody along, I, I pulled up that that policy that you were referring to, or I'm sorry, the d design guideline that you're referring to, mm -hmm. Gary. Yeah. 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 So design guideline 35 and 36. Transparent windows and doors. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It does. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Mm-hmm. It's one of the benefits of doing this by Zoom. I get to yeah. <laughs> pull up all sorts of things. Yeah. And having all your binders in front of you. Yeah. yeah. So, so is the consensus that perhaps we don't need those last two sentences in the, the policy statement because they're in the design guidelines? Is that what I'm hearing? I would agree with that. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Great. All right. So I think that covers the creek policies. I think um, related to the public improvement costs, I think uh, Commissioner Marks, this was um, a request that you had made at one of the earlier meetings for the information on the on the types of improvements. Yes. You had any other comments? No, if, you know, Public Works reviewed it, and so that's fine. Okay. okay. I have no questions, um, Commissioner Kuznick or Wallace. No. Okay, mm -mm. great. All right. So moving into non-conforming land uses, structures, and parcels. There was a request made at the last meeting for more information on how the city addresses non-conforming land uses, um, structures and, and parcels. Um, so that has been attached to your staff report this evening. Um, I think there had been a question related to non-conforming uses um, specifically and, and how uses would be replaced um, if, if, uh, if they were to, to move away. Um, if new uses could replace those, and, and those are found um, on page 7-4 of the, of the zoning ordinance in section D7-2. Well, uh, also, that they have a definition of uh, replacing non-conforming uses with similar uses, and I, I had corresponded with uh, Cindy earlier today about that, and it seems to me that that's the approach that would be taken on packet 7-3 about, let's get down to sort of the, what caused this, which was if the um, Culligan water uh, property were sold, there'd mm -hmm. be an issue about what could be operated on that property. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that when it talks about a non-conforming use of similar or more restrictive classification, or also that's less intense, no more intense than the other, that probably is the only way you can define it. Um, but I suspect this is a citywide issue. So, um, you know, I think that the property owner just have to live with it. Oh, and I know we're gonna talk about the park um, again, but I went back and looked at uh, general plan 2030, which was approved in April of 2011. And the Culligan property was Pick for parks and open space at that time. So it's been listed at least that long as, as such. I couldn't find it in the original 2020 general plan. I didn't have a copy of 2025, but mm -hmm. I think that Cindy researched um, and found that basically the Culligan property had been listed as parks and open space for mm -hmm. a good probably 20 years. Mm -hmm. So since we're on that subject, um, I'm gonna advance a few slides to the, the new slides that were added um, to the staff report. And as Eric had mentioned, um, I pulled up some of our older general plans to get an idea of, of at what point the, 
zoning or the designation changed. And um, I had to go back to 1971. Wow. Incorporated. Um, 1971, when this, when there was a Ceremon Valley plan, um, it actually had zoned that area for the commercial businesses that are currently there right now that, that were established through the 1971 plan. But when the city incorporated in 1983, um, when you go to the city's first general plan, the second general plan, you know, from 95 all the way through the current general plan, um, it all retains this park designation, um, mm -hmm. this green surrounded by the, by the commercial, mm -hmm. and it maintains that park land use um, since the city incorporated. It explains why the buildings exist there and were built in the 60s and 70s um, and, and, and the changeover when the city incorporated to, to going in a different direction. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at uh, the map on the, uh, the left, the current general plan 2035, um, a long, long time ago, the plan was to punch uh, Twin Creeks Drive over mm -hmm. Crow Canyon Road and connect yeah. up with Old Crow Canyon Road to provide that type of lateral assignment. And if you're going to do that, it sort of made sense at that time, I think, to have a park in that area. But we've long since abandoned the idea of punching Twin Creeks through. Mm -hmm. And so while, you know, I, I think that it makes some sense for the four properties that were originally in our package to remain or actually two of them are going to be changed uh to from uh, commercial service office to parks and open space to their two their two parcels uh, home depot and fh and investment that are never going to be developed if you actually go walk the property they are undevelopable they just they slope down into the creek and the creek is like 50 to 60 feet below the surface of the roadway um really the only viable park space is the Culligan water property space, mm -hmm. the only flat large area that you could put anything there to do, a picnic table or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, now the question that came up, uh, and you recall we had a public speaker talking about 2810 Crow Canyon Road, and Cindy's mm -hmm. correct that in the in the general plan that that particular parcel is listed as parks and open space. Mm -hmm. If you've driven down there, you know there's several different dentists building next to it. There's like a fast food place next to that. And next to that is a gas station on the corner. Mm -hmm. um, and the difference between that parcel and the four that Cindy originally put in our packet was that the four parcels are on the west side of the creek. 2810 Crow Canyon is on the other side of the creek, like mm -hmm. north or south, I forget, but it's on yeah. the wrong side of the creek. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me unlikely that you would want to have a small park right along Crow Canyon Road at that point. Um, so, I mean, at least at this way, I would be in favor of, of changing the designation on the four parcels that are on the other side. Uh, I guess that would be the west side of the creek, but the 2810 Crow, um, you know, I don't think should be part of the parks. Now I know that's in the way in the general plan, but is, is that way in the, in the specific plan? That might be a question for me. Um, yes, I'm sorry. I should have been more direct. Yeah. So let me just scroll down here. So I, I've put the different plans side by side here so that you can see the this current plan, the general plan, and, and then the proposed plan. Um, in, the, in the current Crow Canyon plan, the 2810 site is identified as a park site. Is it? Um, and so we would essentially maintain the existing 2006 designation mm -hmm. 
continue to carry that forward. Mm -hmm. um, and then revert back the, the three that um, the Colligan site, the Home Depot site, and the, the FHS site that currently show is commercial um, and, and match the general plan for all five of those to be park. Cindy, if I may, what is the logic behind keeping 2810 as a park if we know it's not likely ever to be a park? Well, at, at this point in time, it would be for consistency with the general plan. And Cindy, the, the, the draft of the plan that at least that I'm looking at from May, I, the, if I'm looking at it correctly, the, if I draw from Twin Creeks on, you're, you're now recommending that we actually change what's in the current plan, which is business mixed use to back to park to match the general plan. Is that correct? Because the document, at least we got in May, had it um, business mixed use, that parcel, I think, or maybe it's hard to tell on the document, you know? That's right. So, okay. Um, okay. right. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Well, I, I'd like to weigh in a little bit again on this. I know that there's value in keeping something consistent with the general plan, but general plans are not holy documents. You can change them. And if you find that you've got a property owner who is sort of caught betwixt and between, um, and you've got a property that you know you're not going to make a particular land use, but you're just keeping it in a certain designation for consistency's sake, that, that escapes logic in my opinion. If we have to change the general plan, you change the general plan. Um, in the meantime, you've left the property owner in a position where it seems to me that that um, they are, they are in an uncertain condition, particularly if they go to sell the property. I, I don't. I guess I just don't understand why we would be hesitant to change the general plan if it is designating a property something that we know we're never going to make into a park. Well, I mean, I agree with Rick's statement that why would we not change the general plan? I would agree with that. The, the question is, we're changing the specific plan so that it doesn't meet the general plan. Now, I think you can, you don't have to be lockstep with the general plan first, the specific plan second. Can't you at some point uh, change either a specific plan or even a, a zoning ordinance and later change the general plan to reflect that. It doesn't have to, I mean, you can have a, you can get together for consistency, but it doesn't always have to go in lockstep, does it? Through the chair. Uh, yeah, actually there is a, there, there is case law on that. Uh, and, the, you know, essentially the, the cases come out that the tail cannot wag the dog and which means that the, you cannot, you can't do a general plan amendment in order to conform with, for example, a zoning uh, ordinance. Uh, it has to be the other way around. So the way that we would want to do this would be to re w maintain consistency with the general plan as we're amending the specific plan. Then if there is a desire to change the general plan, we change the general plan and and do the specific plan at that same time. Can we then send along, as we send recommendations to the city council on the plan, can we send along a um, recommendation that says, the commission recommends that the general plan itself be amended, um, and then the, and then the uh, specific plan as well? I in don't later, see. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, in a later process or now? Well, this is a recommendation that you you would first do what Martin said you had to do, okay. but a recommendation that subsequently you make the the correct plan changes and take twenty eight ten out of the designation as a park and put it into its proper commercial designation. 
there's there's nothing wrong with making that recommendation. <laughs> Well, I think uh, we have to follow our attorney's advice. And since we have to uh, keep the specific plan consistent with the general plan that we change the designation with a, a commentary to the uh, city council that the next time we get around to making changes to the general plan, these ought to be, this ought to be one of them. Again, I mean, right now, the property owner is going to be, you know, using the property as is. So right. it's it's not going to be a, a major problem for him right now. Now, if he contemplates making improvements to the property and so forth, then it would be, in which case, then he would have an interest in amending the general plan and also the specific plan at the same time. Mm -hmm. so, it would also affect him if he was intending yeah. to sell the property. Right. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so let me, let's just, pause here and make sure we're all make sure we understand what we're what we're saying here um, first um, our recommendation is that 2810 and it's only it's only the parcel 2810 or whatever's right there this side of the creek that fronts um, Crow Canyon and it mm -hmm. has the dentist offices there and I know which mm -hmm. the build, what the buildings are our recommendation is is that um, is the mechanics, I'm not sure I fully understand, but our recommendation is, is that if we could get to it, that that becomes zoned as business mixed use through the process. And that's our, that's our consensus from this commission right now. Um, I heard Commissioner Marks, Commissioner Kuznick, Mr. Wallace all feel comfortable that that makes sense, that it doesn't to end up there is part of the plan. And there's some very specific steps that we need to go through to to make sure that happens but we think the right designation for that property is business mixed use not parks is that correct i'm looking to make sure i not misreading the commission yes i'm the pictures are really tiny that's how, I see, it. That's how <laughs> I see it pictures are tiny but that's how i see it okay okay but the mechanics of doing this are anything but straightforward you know and so we can make that recommendation to the city council, but it is going to trigger a general plan um, okay, change. Right. And of course, that's going to take three hearings of the planning commission and three hearings of the city council. And so, you know, that sounds like that's going to actually take place after potentially the specific plan is approved and then we can come back and then make the specific plan consistent with the general plan because you can't have the tail wag the dog the dog has to be happy before the dog's tail can wag okay um and then through the chair it, it does not have to be its own general plan amendment either this could be tacked on to another general plan amendment that that comes right. through. And as a matter of fact, we're limited to the number of general plan right. amendments we can do. Right. So we want to save them up and not waste one on just this. Yeah. And to what Martin said, um, as the commission knows, we are going to be undertaking a comprehensive update to the general plan for the housing elements. Um, and that process will be beginning next year. Okay. Okay. We can wrap it up. We can wrap this discussion. Yeah, in definitely. Update. So we, you don't need council direction to do that. The commission can just say staff, you know, as you're preparing the next update, mm -hmm. bring information forward to us for alternate designations or something of that effect. So, but we we'll, we can handle it that that way. Okay. okay, okay, we made it through another one. I think. Okay. okay. Yes. And okay. The the last slide that we had related to um, desired feedback was on the um, multifamily residential height limits. There had been um, some discussion at, at our last meeting about heights and what um, what the height limits would be in, in the MFR. Um, we had received a, a request from um, one of the property owners related to um, an increase to the current MFR from 45 to 50. Mm -hmm. um, and I, we were just looking for some comments from the commission as to whether or not 45 is, is the appropriate height limit for that MFR zone. 
So Cindy, have, isn't 45 more than what we already had? Wasn't it one time 40? Um, yes. So the underlying zone, CSO, um, has a height limit of 40 feet. But when you put the residential overlay on top, the residential overlay allows for an up to 50 foot height limit. And so the property in question, although you know, if it were to be developed as a, a commercial site, um, would be limited to 40 feet. If it had a residential um, component to it, then it would, would have a, a greater height. So we're currently proposed at 45. So I, I corresponded with Cindy earlier today about um, this property and the, the multifamily housing that we're talking about starts on the space on Deerwood where they have that um, commercial lot that's mm -hmm. right after you get to that um, retaining wall. Mm -hmm. So that's where the MFR starts. And one of the things that was mentioned is the area to the east of that retaining wall is VCMU, which is as a 60 foot height limit. Oh. So that at least the, some of us, I think were thinking that uh, the 60 foot height limit, you drop the higher elevation down, sound familiar? And that's yeah. why you had a lower limit for residential development in the MFR district than you do in the VCMU because the, the MFR district is only on Deerwood uh, up the hill from the core node at, uh, at um, Deerwood and Old Crow Canyon Road. Mm -hmm. So I feel like you left me hanging there, Eric. Where, where well, were you going with that? Well, I, the answer is I think that the, the 45 foot limit uh, is appropriate for that district because it's higher up the hill than the VCMU. So you wouldn't quite see a huge differential in the, in the two tall in the buildings. You reduce the height as you're going up the hill, which is what we were talking about at the beginning of our discussion in uh, the second half today. Mm -hmm. I well, I, I would agree. I, I think it should stay at 45 feet. Right. Yeah. Okay. So is the concern that the, the applicant wanted to exceed 45 and go to 50, correct? Yes, you know, that was the, the thought that was addressed at our last meeting that gave rise to this discussion was right. that they wanted to build um, townhomes or you know residential buildings in that area that exceeded 45 feet. Right, right. You know, and this is also a spot along Gearwood that, you know, not to not to bring back the slope height discussion, but that's a pretty steep part of Deerwood and it's fairly mm -hmm. high and it does, you know, if you recall, that's, you know, there's about, a, I don't know, 20 or 25 foot retaining wall yeah. above, mm -hmm. you right. know, the right. property below. Mm -hmm. So no matter what it looks like there, it's going to feel pretty tall compared to the parking lot below. So I'm, I'm kind of in agreement, the 45 foot feels tall, you know, you know, on that property, right up, you yeah. know, as I recall, they, they also were proposing right up against the property line at the time as mm -hmm. well, you know, mm -hmm. with zero setback as well. So, yeah. you know. Although if you look on the, on the map that um, the difference between the VCMU and the MFR districts, that's where there's supposed to be a path or a paseo that goes down to the tributary of San Ramon Creek. <laughs> I mean, off to the side there is, but along Gearwood and right between the two properties, you know. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, I suppose now this is if it's all residential and they took advantage of some of the density bonuses and things like that, or some of the waivers and things like that, and they wanted to take advantage, maybe they could pursue more affordable housing, you know? And, right, that'd you know, be the trade-off. That would be a trade-off, then mm -hmm. we wouldn't have as much say-so, but I'm comfortable with the 45 foot. You know, yeah, I, that, that's fine with me too, for what it's worth. I already heard Commissioner Mark say that, and I think I heard Commissioner Wallace. So I think we have an answer on that one. 
So that actually covers all of the topics that we were looking for feedback on. Were there any other comments related to the plan? Not exactly to the plan. Maybe this is outside the scope of, of this, but what's the current status of San Ramon Apartments? I thought they had one more extension on their building permit that expired sometime this fall. They, is that the, the Rome property? Yeah. Okay. They do. However, um, the we amended the zoning ordinance to include you know, substantial construction or substantial improvements. And Martin, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and so basically they vested the project um, by demoing the outpost mm -hmm. and they have um, almost perfected their building permit applications. So they're very, they have to keep making progress to maintain that. So if they drop out for a couple years, then that's gonna be a different discussion. But they're continuing to make progress towards getting the project going. Hmm. Okay. Curious. Okay. So, um, Cindy, I think you said we've actually had four public hearings now on this specific plan. And is there anything else from a staff perspective or Andrew that you are still looking for feedback from the commission related to the work to date? Is there anything you feel that you still need feedback on? Um, only just to point out that um, the addendum is attached to this staff report this evening. Um, we do have the consultants available to speak to the the addendum, but um, that's the the only um, additional comment to make is that um, that is something new that's in your packet this evening. Um, and if you have any comments related to that, um, we can certainly provide you answers to those. Well, I was going to have about 30 minutes of questions about flowers, but I decided it's too late to do that. <laughs> well, we can take another five minute break and we can go for another hour. <laughs> it's not or midnight yet. <laughs> oh, it's not 11 o'clock yet. So oh, yeah. can... No, no. Are there, besides that, are there other, other topics or questions that you're looking for feedback? Andrew, Cindy, Lauren, Debbie? No, I think this covers it for me. Thank you. I think we're good. Okay. And then commissioners, are there other areas that you want to explore further? Because then the next question is at the next meeting, are we are we ready to start looking at a resolution and potentially discuss it and then send it to the um, city council? I, I'd like to hold off on deciding that mainly because given the volume of information we received, I haven't made it all the way through the addendum. Um, and I'd like to see, you know, if I have any questions that lead to anything um, the very next time we meet about that. Um, at that meeting, I'd be happy to set a date when we um, you know, want to make a final decision. But at the moment, I, I just haven't finished the addendum yet. Um, through the chair, uh, the continuation is being asked uh, for the 21st. So you're going to skip a meeting here. And so I don't know that there'd necessarily be any harm in bringing forward a resolution for cons consideration. Uh, there's no obligation to take action at that time. Uh, it would just be more information to consider. We're continuing to August 18th is the request. So it's, it's a month and a half out. Okay. And so is, is your is your comment that the resolution will be there and whether we take action or not is we'll decide that night we just may not take action depending on the volume of comments and discussion related to the um, EIR is that my understanding of what you said Lauren and Debbie that would be staff's recommendation yeah okay. would that be okay Commissioner Marks or you're not comfortable with that yeah. I, I will go which way the commission wants to go. No. Commissioner Wallace, Commissioner Kuznick. Well, as I understand it, what, what staff is proposing is a draft resolution 
that does not need to be actually acted upon on the 21st. Um, and that, I guess the driving force for that is whether in the next six weeks, there's additional questions or comments that are developed by anybody um, as a result of going through the uh, addendum or any other material. Um, I, I don't have a particular problem with that. Because you can always continue the, the motion on the uh, resolution to another day. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we're working under any hard and fast deadlines. It's not like it's a housing project. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kuznick? Or, I, I do um, have a question in terms of, um, you know, we have continued to see the drafts of it and changes and so forth. So when it comes to us um, as, as a resolution, will we get what appears to be the the final, 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 or how does that, because I, I have my different piles that I keep kind of going from this version to that version to that version. Are we getting close to having the version? We hope so. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'd like to be able to read what appears to be a final product project. Or, you the know. intent is to bring back the entire response to comments thus far in a consolidated document for your consideration along with the resolution. Okay. Well, through the chair, if I might, if I recall, we're not going to be redlining the specific plan right now. There's going to be an errata that will be attached. So you're not going to get a new document. You're going to get a list of changes that will then be made after the council's adoption of the plan. We don't keep revising the plan through the process. We'll provide you with what's going to be changed in the future. So we're going to be making a decision potentially on a resolution based on an errata sheet. Correct, which is the practice of the commission. It's an errata sheet for what document? The Crow Canyon specific plan. The 206 version? The current version. The draft in front of you. So the commission has made changes throughout the process and yeah. we document as Andrew noted, we document those changes as we've done with other um, policy documents that we've developed. And so you'll have a list of all those changes that will be made once it's for the final printing. With the zoning ordinance, we had a running list of errata changes through that mm -hmm. process commission mm -hmm. that were attached to the resolution and then made subsequent after the adoption by the city council. Okay. I think I understand that. So the the recommendation from staff is on for the prior to the August 18 um, planning commission meeting, we will get a, a revised errata sheet. And at that meeting, we will, the topic will be a review of the EIR um, or the document that the addendum. we were given, the addendum that we were given tonight and then a draft resolution and the agenda for that night would be the addendum to the EIR and a discussion of the um, um, specific plan um, as modified by the errata sheet plus um, the draft resolution and the action that night is either to um, continue the meeting or to approve the resolution? Is that my understanding of what we're kind of talking about as our agenda for that, that meeting on the 18th? That is correct. The okay. commission has the option to approve the project or recommend to the city council, or they can, if they need additional information, um, they can continue it to date certain. Okay, okay. I mean, I personally am comfortable with this because I feel like we've, we've actually been at this for you know, quite a number of sessions. You know, and I think we've we've done a really very thorough job. You know, at this point, you know we've you know you know we've been at it for several years, as a matter of fact. You know, so I am I am comfortable. You know, with this approach. You know, so. You know. All right. Okay. So like we, we want. Have a game plan. So, so we do. So I think we need mm -hmm. a motion to continue this to August the eighteenth. Yeah. I'll move we continue the hearing on the Crow Canyon specific plan to August 18th. I need a second, please. I will second the motion. Thank you. Okay. 
Let me just get this down. We have Vice Chair Wallace is, as the mover and Kuznick as the seconder. Um, okay, so Vice Chair Wallace, mover. Aye. Commissioner Kuznick, seconder. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Frank is absent. We have Commissioner Marks. Aye. And, and Vice Chair Alpert. Um, aye. Chair. All right. Mm -hmm. To continue the item to August 18th. Okay. So that brings us to item 11, um, non-public hearing action items, which we do not have any. And then item 12 is study session, commissioner liaison report and interest item staff reports. Item 12.1 is selection of two commissioners for an ad hoc committee for housing advisory committee interviews. Good, good evening. Um, as, in, <laughs> as with past practices, we're looking for volunteers, two volunteers to conduct interviews um, for the HAC uh, appointment. Uh, it will be done uh, virtually at this point. So we'll coordinate that with whoever's interested in participating. Do you have a sense about when you're going to do them, uh, Lauren? How um, soon? I, I don't have a timeline yet. Okay. But, uh, we need to put together the committee. They're recruiting right now. Okay. So uh, it should be within the next few weeks. Okay. Okay, since it's my uh, liaison assignment, I'll volunteer. Okay. We need one more. I always like doing these interviews. I, I think they're fun, but you know, I don't want to always do them, but if somebody wants to do them instead. And Commissioner Frank's not here. Okay, Hello. Commissioner Marks. Commissioner Marks and Commissioner Wallace. <laughs> this is a, a Gary, you and I did it last time. I know, but I think they're fun. You get to oh, meet yeah. people. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. For um, study sessions or liaison reports. Okay. <laughs> no, nobody. Okay. Lauren, <laughs> coming. How many attractions, Lauren? <laughs> okay, on the uh, 21st, we will be coming back to you with the City Walk, a response to comments on the EIR, uh, draft conditions, and uh, resolutions for consideration. We also will be bringing back the Russian School of Math. They made some improvements to their parking lot, and so uh, we'll have a, an additional discussion there. Um, and then um, we're looking in terms of August 4th, um, we're gonna have the City Walk uh, uh, project again, as well as uh, the EOC uh, addition, the Emergency Operations Center addition at 2401 Crow Canyon Road. And so that's a near term schedule. Okay, great. Thank you everybody and we'll Go ahead and adjourn at 10.16. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.